بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين أبدين My remarks tonight with a deep sense of gratitude to Brother Nazir Ghulam Hussain, the President of Toronto Jamaat and his whole executive body for making such a forum that was overdue, a possibility in the Jamaat which has gone a long way to establish its relationship not only with the Muslim community but also with the community at large in this very city. My special thanks are to Al Haj Mullah Asghar, who has made this special trip to honor us not only with his presence but with his wisdom and a long experience in dealing with his community in the most amicable way. But of all the gratitude that I can express, I'm here tonight for you. If it had not been for you, you, the community, I would not have come here. You mean to me very much. You have been my teachers. You have trained me. You have taught me. You have tolerated me at different stages of my development as a spokesperson for Islam in North America. <clears throat> Without your support at different times in our history, this would have been impossible. And therefore I have come tonight not to defend myself, I have come to share what I know of the subject and its treatment, both in the religious context as much as in the university context. In the Quran, we have been reminded, Man kana fi hadhi al-a'ma wa huwa fi al-akhirati a'ma wa adhaldu sabila. If a person is blind in this world, he shall be blind in the hereafter, and much worse, he would lose the path. Human history has been the history of understanding the purposes for which God has created us. There is no way for us to fathom, to understand, to appreciate all that God has given us in order to further our knowledge about our religion. This is one of the truths that has been promised to us. Therefore, I shall begin by providing you the context in which I first of all wrote my book. Because there are two kinds of readership that one can write a book for. 
At one point, you can write a book for those who believe with you, who share your faith with you. And you can write a very straightforward account of your belief system without engaging in any kind of intellectual appreciation of that religion. What is important is to convey with authenticity and authority that which is supposed to be conveyed to the average believer in any community. This is the religious discourse, the religious language that is used in any community. And I have a good example of it, which has taught me something very, very important. Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini has a book entitled Dad Gustare Jahan. And it deals with Imam Sahib al Zaman alayhi salam. By engaging in translation of that book, especially in the context of what is happening at the moment in the community and the misunderstanding that is prevalent because of what I have written in Islamic Messianism, the academic study on the idea of the Mahdi in Twelve Shiism, I discovered there's a lot of convergence in the religious discourse that is meant for the believer who does not necessarily share that conviction. Not all of us are at the same level of our belief. Some of us are skeptic. Some of us have doubts. Some of us are fully convinced. And all this is important to keep in mind as we read the very important book that has been written by Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini, which will be, inshallah, available to you as soon as it is printed. But there is another level of discourse. There's another, another level of communication. And this is with the non-believing world. With the world that does not share with you your belief. And this is the academic world and which we as North American Muslims can ill afford not to engage in any kind of dialogue with the universities. It will be our decision, if we made so, to insulate ourselves from any kind of rational thought, any kind of historical approach, any kind of critical studies of the texts that are not infallible, that are written by other scholars, however good, however honest, but they are scholarly works of other scholars. That discourse is the discourse of academia, universities. Whereas in the first kind of discourse you can engage in talking to the fellow believer, pointing out to the verses of the Quran, pointing out to the necessary hadiths that are reported on the authority of our imams. In the second kind of discourse, you're almost helpless. You can't quote them without engaging, first of all, in their critical assessment by saying very clearly that we know you don't accept these things. We know you don't believe in these things, but these are our sources. We depend on them to talk about our religion. The context then is of Islamic Messianism, the book that I have written is the non-Muslim world in which I am engaged in responding to the accusations of the Orientalists for more than a century and a half. And I will share some examples with you. This 
was the earliest book that was written. It is a photocopy, by the way. It's just bound in the old binding. And I want you to understand that the Orientalists who worked on Islam were talking this language, and I'm sure it will anger you. Please forgive me for that. Because of these, with these words, Muhammad is reported to have addressed once his nephew and son-in-law Ali. Because of thee, because of thee, because of you, two parties will come into ruin. Thy overzealous admirers and thy passionate haters. In this short sentence, put into the mouth of the prophet, put into the mouth of the prophet, look at the language. By a retrospective consideration, that means after it had already occurred, of history is clearly indicated the main source of the decomposition of Islam in the past and present. Are you with me? So Shia movement is the source of decomposition of Islam. This is one of the most important authorities of Harvard University, Friedman. He wrote this book. And he wrote these comments. And you can see, and he goes on. I'm sure many of you have heard Bernard Lewis on television. He is a Princeton scholar. This is more recent. He's talking about the comparing the Sunni view and the Shi view. Look at the way the Shi view is presented. The Shi view is completely different. After the murder of Ali, who for the Shiites was the only rightful caliph after the prophet, the remaining caliphs were all usurpers and history had taken a wrong turning. The Muslim community was, so to speak, living in sin, in a kind of Islamic equivalent of the Jewish Galut, even of the Shekinah in Galut, and the divine presence in exile. For the Shia, the actions of usurping rulers, the, ruler, the rulings of the heretical jurists, had no value and had no significance. Shiite historiography is, in, a, in consequence, poor by comparison with Sunni historiography. Even more direct attack on what the subject that I am talking about. The idea of the Mahdi. This is Gol Ziha, one of the prominent pillars and if we don't keep this context in mind, it will be very difficult to see my comments in Islamic messianism. It will be extremely difficult to do so. And he's arguing that the Shi idea of Mahdi was directly taken from the Jews and the Christians. The Quran had nothing on the idea. The Hadith had nothing on the idea. And this was taken from the Jews and the Christians. And he says, and I quote, according to this group, the Twelvers, the office of Imam passed from Ali through the direct descendants down to the 11th visible Imam, whose son and successor, Muhammad Abu Qasim, was taken from earth while still a child, not yet eight years old. He has lived since in occultation, invisible to humankind, will appear at the end of the time as the Imam al-Mahdi, the savior of the world, to rid the world of its all injustice and to establish the rule of peace and righteousness. This is the so-called hidden Imam, who has continued to live since his disappearance and whose reappearance is daily awaited by the Shi'i believer. And then he goes on saying that the return is thus one of the decisive elements in the Imam theory of each branch of the Shia. Opinions about them vary. And he says, the idea of the return did not originate among the Shia. Judeo-Christian influence probably contributed this belief to Islam. The prophet Elias, who was carried off to heaven and will at the end of time reappear on earth to establish again the rule of righteousness, is the most likely prototype of the hidden imam who have been taken from earth, hidden imams who have been taken from earth live unseen and will one day reappear as Mahdi's. You can see the animosity, the, the actual devaluation of Shi religion as having anything to do with Islam. 
French Orientalist Blochet does the same thing, but he says that it is not the Jewish idea, but it's the Iranian Bahrami Gur, who was the prototype of the Mahdi in Shiism. With all this, of course, you have thousands. I just picked up what was quickly available to me in my office. With this in mind, when I started writing my research, I was faced with a situation, how do I proceed? I don't have to prove to you my faith. I have lived in this community, and everybody knows me. I don't have to declare, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. For you, it is a reality you have lived with me. You have seen me growing among yourselves. For me, to give the shahada of Imam Sahib al-Zaman is part of my privilege. It's part of my privilege. It's an honor to be part of the 12 or Shia community, both in reality and in faith. But you're addressing the world that is very much against you. If you proceed, in the language that you use for the faithful in the community, then you are declared as apologetic and nobody takes you seriously. The dialogue ends before even it begins. Therefore, one has to tread a very careful path. Now here we come to understand an important issue about the method. What exactly is the university method doing, which is to us upsetting. When we as believers open a book written on an Islamic subject by the university professors, they actually anger us because we think that they are saying things that we don't believe in. They attribute to us things that we never believed in. We don't believe in those things that they, they are telling us that we believe in. So it angers you. And we resist those kinds of attributions to us. Because not only it goes against our faith, but it also challenges our long tradition of believing. How can anyone do such a thing? But that's what academia does. Why does it do it? Let us begin to talk about the method. What is the method in the university? In the university, we are dealing with a very important issue of academic truth. What we deal in the community between you and me, we are dealing with one and only one absolute religious truth. The university says, or the social scientists, the humanities, they are telling us that no, we really need to examine something objectively. What do you mean by objectively? I always believed in this. What kind of objectivity do you want? I said, no. Objective means something that you can examine, investigate. Here comes the importance of the text. You're reading a text, and you want to explain to the non-believer, to your fellow academicians, that this is where your belief comes from. Now, if you're doing that, you have to actually tell your audience, your academic audience, your educated audience, that these texts were written at a given time in history. If one text was written 300 years ago, there's another one that was written 1,000 years ago. There's another one that was written 800 years ago. In other words, you have to establish a chronology of the text. In other words, the university is telling us, as researchers, that look, whatever you believe to be true in your religion, we cannot accept that to be objective ground for you to speak about your religion. Your religion can be so spoken about only through your texts. So let's begin with the Quran then. And I'll pose you a very difficult situation, which was dealt with even more, I think, clearly by Ayatollah Amin in his book. It's 
a very interesting book, Ayatollah Amini, when he wrote the book, he wrote the book with three audience in mind. There were skeptic Shia, first of all, but there were also Sunnis who did not believe in what we believe, and there were also Baha'is and Babis, who, as you know, have exploited the belief in Al Qaim Al Mahdi, as you all know that they are part of that vision, and therefore they've, that's what they've done. Dr. Fahimi, it's 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 a very interesting way of approaching it. It's a beautiful book because what he has done is that he has presented his views with a dialogue. So there is Dr. Fahimi, who is a Sunni. There is Dr. Imami, who is a Shia. There is Mahandis Madani, who is again a Shi, but a skeptic Shi, who doesn't really believe in these things. And then we have Aray Hushyar. Aray Hushyar actually is Ayatollah Amini himself. Because he is the school teacher and he is the one who is giving the answers for everything. Let us look at our question, text. When you start your research in the university, they say, what do your text say about it? Well, where do we begin our research? If somebody tells us, what do you believe in Islam, where do you go first? In the Quran, definitely. And if you go in the Quran, you have to look at the ayats, you have to look at the verses and the... And go on checking, is there anything in the Quran about what you are researching? In my case. What am I searching for? The idea of Mahdi, is it in the Quran? The same problem is faced by Ayatollah Amini. Look at how he deals with it. Dr. Fahimi. This is what Dr. Fahimi says. If the tradition of the Mahdi was authentic, then there would have been some mention of it in the Quran. On the contrary, even the word Mahdi does not appear in the heavenly book. Who is Dr. Fahimi? A Sunni. He's asking, I Hushyar, who is a Shia? Mr. Hushyar is answering. First, and what a good answer he gives. It is not necessary that each and every true subject should be mentioned in all its specific details in the Quran. You and me, even if we were to search the proper salat in the namaz, you will not find it. Is it not true? You will not find it. We have to go to the prophet in order to know the namaz. You can't find it. So in the Quran then, this is Ayatollah Amini responding. In fact, there are so many particular details that are true and authentic, and they have not been mentioned in the heavenly book at all. The Quran does not mention them. Second, there are a number of verses in that holy book, which, however in brief, give tidings about the day when the devout worshippers of God and those, those who support the true religion and those who are worthy of that blessing would rule the earth in its entirety. A very important answer is given here that the Quran promises the world to whom? To the righteous servants of God who will come, who will inherit the earth and this has been interpreted by all our Mufassirin as referring to Imam Sahib Zaman alayhi salam. This particular ayah, this particular ayah has been mentioned to refer, but it talks about, what does it talk about? It talks about the ability of the righteous servants who were wronged at one time to gain power in the world. We have been wrong. The Shia, it's not only the Western scholarship, but in general, our Sunni brothers have been very unkind to us. They have really done a lot of damage to us. And they have tried to negate us as much as possible, right? But they did not succeed, because we have documents to establish it that the true Islam is certainly the Islam of the Ahlul Bayt. There's no doubt about that. Now, here, You can go on citing the verses of the Quran, but it is not satisfactory to the non-believer. You and me, we can immediately relate ourselves to the verses of the Quran that however indirectly are making references to the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will have 
one day the right to rule this earth the way God wants it to rule. By the way, this is the central point of the Quran. If you look at the Quran, let us talk about salvation in the Quran. What does the Quran teach about salvation? Salvation means final najat of individuals. Don't you remember the words of the Quran? Inna ladina amanu amilu salihat ulaikahum khairul bariyya. Those who believe and those who act righteously, they are the ones who will be the best. They are the ones who are the best. They are, these are the ones who are saved ones. Bariyya. But, it doesn't speak about anything else. If somebody asked you to prove from the Quran, well, how does the Quran see our future? You can always say, Inna ladina amanu amilu salat. Inna ladina amanu amilu salat. By the way, in the Iman, we are required to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the prophethood, and in our Imams alayhim salam. That's part of the Iman. You cannot have a complete iman in the ladina aman. What does iman is? What is iman? You can't say that well, my iman is only God, and I don't believe in the prophet. I don't believe in the imams. Or you can't say that I believe only in the God and the prophet. I don't believe in the imams because that is the part of iman. Now, I have to explain this to the non-believing academician, and I have to make an argument. And what argument do I make? That we have to take the followers of the religion to be an important key to our understanding. It's not only the text, it's the followers who are important. You and me, the way we see our religion is far more important than the way the books speak about it. Isn't that true? The feelings that I and you share about our religion I'll cite a very sensitive example, but please forgive me for that. Please forgive me for that. We all know, we all are saying in our awan, in our iqama, Ashhadu anna amir al-mu'mineen ali hujjatullah. We all say it. And I don't believe we'll ever give up on that. Look at our, look at our scholarship. Starting from Sheikh Tusi and Nihaya, Sheikh Tusi regards uttering this statement as bid'ah. That means it's haram to say it. Sheikh Tusi, a scholar. So what? Sheikh Mufid. Later on you find others are doing the same thing. My point is this, that you and me, when we give the shahada about Amir al-Mu'mineen, we believe in Amir al-Mu'mineen to be Amir al-Mu'mineen. Regardless of what the book says. If we were to follow the books that our scholars have produced, then we will be having part of the faith to be removed from us. So the books are not that significant. They are significant. They play a major role. But we, all of us, play a major role. Now, I want to ask all of us, how do we look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? For all of us, the Prophet is not merely a human being, but he's a special human being. For all of us, unquestionably. But there's an element of devotion. When we study the Quran itself, the Quran is looking at the Prophet as not only the Prophet, but as absolutely human being. Even Il Maghaib is taken away from him. Ayatollah Khui has a very important section in Al-Bayan fi Tafsir al-Quran where he discusses the whole problem of how much does a prophet know about the future. Now you and me, we believe that the prophet knows everything. He can predict anything. When you talk to the non-believer, can you talk that language? Can you tell them, this is what, what we believe, this is what our books, you are going to make a convincing point to them. Recently, World Federation has a book that is written about the understanding of Islam. What is the title? I'm not very sure. The, the title of the book? Uh, 
uh, the other one that is introducing Islam to the non-believers. First, first step in understanding Islam. And we are reaching out people who do not share the belief with us, by the way. It could be our Sunni brothers. It could be non-believers completely. In that book, I have not seen. I must be honest. I have not seen the book. But I was told that in that book, there is no mention of Vilaya. Does it mean that we don't believe in Vilaya? Does it mean that World Federation is projecting Islam without Vilaya? Or is it trying to reach out the public who needs gradually to be introduced to the Vilaya? You see, we are faced with these difficulties. And if we don't talk to the academic world, our voice is not heard. We will be marginalized as they have marginalized all of us. How many of us are invited to speak in the universities? How many of us can speak to the colleges? How many of us are invited to speak so that we can present Islam? And believe it or not, sometimes you are treating a very fine line. How much can you say? And how much should you say to the non-believing people? And you make a choice, you make a decision. Those decisions are not based on the person's faithlessness. Just as I went in the Islamic Messianism, and I am proving consistently throughout the book, you will not find a single statement in the book in which I have denied the imamat of Imam Sahib Zaman Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I take it as a given truth. Go and say page to page. You can underline as many lines as you want. You can take me to task for different things. But on this question, you will not be able to take me. Because I have not. I have not done it. I have not done it. Because I believe that the Quran has taught us to expect one day that leader to come and to establish the just society on earth. Our obligation, you and my obligation, is to create the best possible society on earth. Isn't that true? We are, not only, we are not only supposed to be sitting in the mosque and doing our tasbihat and reading our salawat and, re and fasting. We are supposed to work in the society. We are, going to, we are supposed to go and feed the poor. We are, going, we are supposed to go and work as welfare agents. Because we are supposed to do that as part of our belief system. Because we believe that God in the Quran, He has required us. Which is the foundation of a good society. A good society is a moral society. In which you can tell a person that this is what you believe in, this is what you should believe in. And therefore, I firmly believe that the imamat of Imam Sahib al-Zaman is established in the Quran like the imamat of all of them. Why should there be a doubt even in, even in my mind at all? It is in the Quran that we learn about the imamat. Because God has sent us the guidance. And that guidance has to continue. Either we believe that God has abandoned us, has left us without guidance, or we believe that that guidance continues to come. And why do we need that guidance? We need that guidance because the function of the Mahdi is to be divinely guided to fulfill the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? What is the purpose of Imam Sahib al-Zaman? Why do we believe in him that he is the Mahdi? Because we believe that he is divinely guided. This is our belief in the Nafs. This is our belief in the Nas, that we believe that he's been divinely guided so that he can continue to function as the divinely guided person. No human being can live that many years. And Ayatollah Amini has a long, very beautiful section again on the longevity, long life. And we are supposed to use all the information that we have in order to further the information. In other words, methodology in the university is based on historical method but that historical method is properly grounded you see now if I could have written that book if you look at the language that I have used in the book it's extremely sensitive language in fact I have a letter from State University of New York 
when I sent it out for publication, they sent the manuscript to three readers. One of the readers said, this book should be published in Najaf because it is too defensive. It is too defensive. What I have not done, which the Orientalists have done, is to insult my own belief. I can't do that. I can't do to, to my own faith. I can criticize, but what I have criticized is textual. And let me come to that. Please, I know I'm taking, it was supposed to be a statement, but I need to go through this in order for you to be with me, in order for you to understand, you don't have to agree with me, please. You don't have to agree with me. You have all the right to disagree with me completely. And it's your privilege. As the audience, you have the right to disagree. And you have the right to reject anything that I say. Well, let me give you the example. No, I will not read them all. <laughs> you go, you are doing research in the text. You are now moving away from the Quran. You are coming to the Hadith. Because that's the next step. Al-Quran wal sunnah That's the next step. So you want to find out what has been thought about that. Again, university requires you to prove with the text. Whatever you see, you must be able to cite a footnote. If you can't cite a footnote, it's a defective scholarship. By the way, even our ulama knew this very well. Our great ulama were very careful in what they were citing from others. And there was so much what we call trustworthiness that Franz Rosenthal, one of the professors of Yale University, has a book, Al-Manhaj Al-Ilmi in the Muslimin, Scientific Research Method Among Muslims. And he discusses how we document things, how we read things. So you go to the books, and you are forced here to look at the first publication that is available to you in the form of manuscript for that matter. It could not be a published book. It could be in the library of Ayatollah Milani, Ayatollah Marashi, or somebody in Najaf somewhere. You're trying to find a first written source on the history, on the idea, where there is a mention of that thing in that book. What you are doing then is that you are compiling a list of books that were written in a chronological form. You are engaged in searching for your sources. I'll give you a very good example. Let's, let's assume for a moment that I want to write a history of God. And there are four of four, three scholars are on the table here. Maulana Rizvi wrote a book on belief in God a hundred years ago. Dr. Takim writes a book 50 years later on the history of God, on the idea of God, on belief in God. Mullah Asghar is also writing another book about 20 years ago. We have three books, one hundred years ago, one fifty years ago, one twenty years ago. In all these three books that we examine, we find that the idea of God and all of them happen to be believers. They are not rejecting the belief in God, but they are discussing the history of that belief. In the process of, history, of discussing the history, they are finding sources which they use to write their own books. So Molana Rizvi writes a book on the history of God Hundred years ago, whatever was present in the libraries, he saw them and he wrote it. Similarly, Dr. Takim does the same thing. Similarly, Mullah does the same thing. I, in 1995, decided I want to write a book on the history of God also. So I took all these three books written by these three scholars at different intervals, started checking them. I discovered that Maulana Rizvi, when he wrote hundred years ago, this was 1890s. There was no technology, there was nothing at that time. The arguments he presents, the ideas he's examining, don't do anything, don't deal much with science, with technology or anything. 
When I reached Mullah's book, I discovered that no, Mullah is fully informed about technology, about the uh, electronic mails, etc. And therefore, in his argument to prove God's existence, he is using everything possible that is available to him in the knowledge, in the libraries, in what he has learned himself. What we then have is a book that I write in which I discuss Rizvi, I discuss Sakim, I discuss Mullah. According to Mullah, this is what he says. Now, I may also engage in my own self-critical assessment, saying that Mullah Rizvi did not know much about technology. Therefore, he could not write about it, but Mullah Asra knew about it. I'm saying to you, I'm, si I'm asking a very simple question to you. Is this exercise a wrong exercise in your opinion? If somebody writes it like that, do you think he's abandoning his faith in God or God is an independent reality besides these books? And there could be thousands of books. Similarly, I'm examining the idea of the Mahdi. Which book is speaking for the first time about the Mahdi? So I find something that was written during the Ghaibat al -Sughra. Then something written about 100 years after it. Very interestingly, as I read, I discover that this author who is writing 100 years after, he says that I saw this book. So this was written 100 years ago. This was written 100 years after. And he says that I saw this in the book that was written by this person by the name of Naubakhti. So I take the text, I examine, I say, I put it together, I say, all right, this is what he has done. He has examined, he has said these things in this book 100 years ago. But what I discover is that this author 100 years later on is adding information that is not present in that book that was 100 years ago. Now in those days, there were no footnoting. Sometimes you commented on things, it became part of the text. Footnoting process is much later. And you find this was more prevalent among the fuqaha than among the mutakallimin. Theologians did not care for footnoting. They did not say that this is what I got and this is what I'm adding. You know what we do is that we, we, we caught it. We caught something in quotation marks. We say, this is in the book. What the else what I'm saying is from me. So you know that this is what Aziz is saying. This is what the author is saying. What you have then is a development of the idea. Further details of the idea. And I, I just want you to bear with me that as we go along in history, this was the first book that was written on Ghaiba of Imam Sahib Zaman by Nu'mani. This is the first book by Nu'mani. Then we have Sheikh Mufid writing Al-Fusul Al-Ashara, the second one. Then we have Sheikh Tusi, Sheikh Mufid, Sheikh Tusi. Between them, Sharif Al-Murtaza also has a book has a short discussion about the Ghaiba. And you are talking, you are moving from 9th century to 10th, 11th, 12th century. You come to 17th century, which is Allama Majlisi. Three volumes on the same subject. He has compiled all the possible knowledge on the subject. What we are saying, what I am saying is that you don't question the basic presumption, but you question and you investigate the development of religious knowledge. What you are then engaged in discussing is the history of religious knowledge and not the belief itself. Are you with me? By examining these books, by investigating them, I'm talking about university approach, because that's what you are supposed to be doing. If you don't do it, then you are out of that circle. You are no more part of the academia. If you are part of the academia, then you have to accept the responsibility. And I believe that we need more Muslim scholars to be in the university so that we can treat our subject with respect and sensitivity. We are sensitive. We don't throw them around. When we, I, for example, in Islamic Messianism, I take Quran as the infallible book of God. I don't even discuss it. I take the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a given fact, but I also add a dimension. All right, 
He was God appointed, but also let's look from the, from the angle of the people. Let's find what the people are saying about it. And it's important for us to combine this. In other words, we have a very, very difficult task in front of us. Believe it or not, it is easier to speak to the community of the believers. Because you are part of them. You don't have to worry about it. You can talk about your faith. But try to teach a course on Islam in the university. When you are bombarded by your students, not only about the Shia faith, about the Shia terrorist, about the Shia fundamentalist, but you are bombarded about the prophet's treatment of the Jews, the prophet's treatment of the women, and so many other issues. And believe it or not, it is easier to talk to the community sometimes than to talk to the academic community. Because the challenge is that you don't want to compromise your belief. You don't want to compromise your belief. You know, if we, I think there is an, an air of what I call unnecessary bashing of academ academics in the community. I think what we really need to understand is that jihad are or two kinds. One jihad is fought within the community. We are engaged in jihad. Ask Mullah, ask anybody who sits on the member and has to deliver to the community for 50 minutes, 60 minutes, what we think is the best of our faith. It's a tough thing. You come to the academics and you have to do the same thing, but not to the believers. To the people who don't share with you the belief, how are you going to deal with it? Tell them this is what God wanted. Does it work? It doesn't work. So you develop what I call academic treatment of religion. And academic treatment of religion takes this textbook and says, this black textbook was written, this book was written by Sheikh Mufid. It was not written by Imam Jafar Sadiq It's very important to remember. This book was written by Alama Madlisi. Alama Madlisi is not Ma'asum. He's a scholar like any of the scholars on the bench here. Therefore, he can be prejudiced, he can be biased, he can be objective, he can be subjective. There is no such thing as sacredness in human scholarship. Human scholarship is open to challenge. My book, Islamic Messianism, you can tear it apart and throw it. That's an academic work. It's an academic work which can be challenged by anyone. But remember, you can challenge only when you examine the same sources that this person has examined, I have examined. Then you give yourself a right, that all right, we have a problem with this particular issue. Look at the isma. I talk about isma in the book. And isma of our imams and the prophet. And I say that, and I remember vividly, that isma was something that developed even furthermore on strict terms as we move away from the times of the Imams. From Ibn Babawe, who said that it was possible that the Imam could forget something, to Sheikh Mufid, who corrected his own teacher, saying that no, he can't forget things. Then how about confidence in that Imam? And you go on, and this is what you have to note down. You can't say you don't see the sources. Because your integrity as a scholar is involved. And this is a very fine line. And I understand the sensitivity. By the way, I appreciate and I respect a lot your concern. Your concern is not totally unfounded. When you raise objections to this academic treatment, I think it is your right to ask those questions and to treat this question seriously. And I'm happy to learn that people are reading things seriously. Things are not, academic things are not easy. They're not like good novels or bestsellers. They're difficult to read. Anybody who takes time to read those, they are showing that they are concerned about issues. What we need to do is that we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the person who is writing. And remember the context in which the work is being produced. And there we will discover something very different. And we'll discover that it is extremely difficult. 
I was invited in Tehran to speak on human rights in Islam. My paper was written in English and it was simultaneously actually even translated before I went there in Farsi and Arabic. And on the debate, as you know, there's a burning debate on Islam and human rights. Most of the Western scholars would tell us Islam does not even have a concept of right. There's no right. There are only obligations. There are only duties. Which is false, as we know. Ayatollah Jannati was sitting next to me. And I was reading English text. Farsi told me, read slowly because we are following your arguments. And my arguments were not only critical the way we deal with the whole question of human rights, and the way we say, oh, we have all these rights. We really treat our women very well. We treat all our people. I said, no, we really take, we need to take stock of our own behavior. And my message was very clear that we need to look at the Quran very carefully in order to establish our conception of human rights. And it was greatly appreciated. I thought there would be an uproar because I knew that the Farsi and Arabic translations were going on simultaneously that there would be a problem there because I was talking about very different issues. And they were very innovative in our religious thought. Nobody speaks like that. And it was accepted as a good academic critique of the problem. If we don't do it, and if we don't allow a voice that can speak to the larger community of humanity, then we are failing in one of the most important issues of communicating our religion. We are not communicating to each other only. We are communicating to the outside world. Let me try to come very quickly to the conclusion because I know you are anxious. So if you were to read this book on human rights, conflict of cultures and human rights, then you might be even more angry with me for saying that, well, 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 he is criticizing our record, our historical record of intolerance and so on and so forth. Well, it is a very, I would say, source-oriented research. That means you look in the sources. By the way, I discuss only the Sunni sources here. When I talk about this particular issue, I talk about only the Sunni sources. Well, we have to do it. If we don't do it, somebody, will, somebody else will do a very bad job of it. What I had a chance to do in this book, which is the source of all the discussion and debate tonight, and I've already clearly mentioned that I firmly believe, and I will assert this without any reservations, that the idea of the Quran that there has to be a just society requires that there has to be Imam Sahib Zaman with it. It's very clear. It's very clear. In our philosophy of intezar, in our philosophy of waiting, this is what I do. And I get the opportunity to say these things in the conclusion. Usually we read the first few pages, we don't come to the conclusion. If at all, we read something that is a little difficult to read, I must say. It's my students complain that it is too academic. All right. The most important, this is the conclusion, and I, I want you to realize English language, and this is said, this is Jumla in Shai, declaration. The most important point about the Islamic Messiah, Al-Mahdi, is that he will come forth. I've been taken to task by my Western colleagues for saying that he will come forth. What did they expect me to say? Grammatically, what did, they, what did they expect me to say? He would come. Because would would have been my doubt in that. You see, there is a language. If I say would, then I'm, even I'm in doubt myself. He would, would, he, would he come? But this is what I do. And I've been criticized very thoroughly. If you see the book reviews on this book, and he, they say that this, he is almost making declarations about his fate without 
stopping himself from doing so. He will come forth from his occultation and appear for the sight of all mankind. Will come for all mankind. Who is talking there? Source. There's no footnote. There's no footnote. It's me. I have a chance. I have, I have a right to discuss everything critically here. In conclusion, it is my conclusion. And nobody can stop me from writing what I want to write. What I have discovered. Alright? So this is what I say. The appearance then, Zuhur of the 12th Imam, absorbs the interests of the Imamids in general and the traditionists in particular. And as seen in the previous chapter, they behold this appearance in numerous apocalyptic visions about how he will come, what will happen, catastrophes, and other things. They long and pray. I can't say I long and pray. I can't say we long and pray. This is academic work. If I was writing only for the community, I would have said we long and we pray. That would have been my language, right? They long and pray for the fulfillment of these visions. The message conveyed in the numerous traditions about the appearance is that the Zuhur of the Mahdi is at hand and that the religious and the righteous and the elect adherents of the Imam who long for it should not despair at the seemingly prolonged ghaybah of the Messianic Imam. Isn't this the eye of the Quran? That they will, the righteous ones who will inherit the world. You are citing, the, you are influenced by the Quran, you are citing the verses of the Quran without even telling your readers. So that the academic work is not rejected as not being academic. In other words, my personal faith and statement is in the book. But it is a book based on research. I criticize hadith. When I think that the hadith is fabricated, I do say it is fabricated. I should say it. I don't think I should hide it. If I know that something was not there in the earlier source, it has appeared in the latter source, I can't say I didn't see it. There's kind of honesty that is required in the research. And I'm not harming or I'm not doing any harm to the religion at all. It is the sources. For me, none of these books are infallible. The only infallible book for me is this book. This is the only infallible book as far as I'm concerned. Others need to be examined. Others need to be checked, investigated against the Quran. If they don't agree, as Fatima Zahra sallallahu told us, any tradition that is attributed to my father, and if it does not agree with the Quran, is not from my father. Hasn't she laid down the criterion groundwork that how do we judge? And inshallah, you will be able to see the same. What I've shared with you is my academic experience, and I'm sure you have many questions to that, but I'll leave it to our moderator, the president, to see how it goes. Thank you very much for your patience and for your listening. Assalamu alaikum. going to address us, uh, followed by uh, Maulana Rizvi, if he wishes to make a statement at that time. Dr. Liaquat Sakin has said that he doesn't feel it is necessary, but he is also welcome to make a statement after Mullah is finished. After that, we'll break for tea, and then we'll get into the question series. الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عبد المصطفى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما على بقية الله حجة الله في الأرض المهدي المنتظر عجل الله فرجه الشريف مستر بريزيدنت دانش مند محترم دکتر عبدالعزیز سچے دیدہ دانشمند محترم دکتر لیاقت رکیم حجت الاسلام آقا سید محمد الموسوی محمد الرضوی مائی سسٹرز اور برادرز ان ایمان سلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ There are certain factors which have got to be clarified before I proceed into the subject First and foremost, that I have not come here, Mr. President, as the President of World Federation, nor have I come here as an academic scholar. I have come here as a humble student of Islam and a servant of Imam Zaman, Ajjalallahu <laughs> Faraj. Therefore, I lay no pretense and no claim at any academic attainment. And I can assure you, my friend, that the books that I have brought are not mine. First of all, they are lesser in number than the ones displayed by my friend, Dr. Abdul Aziz, sallamahullah. And secondly, most of the books here are his and not mine. I have gone through each and every page of it, I can assure him, and I can now proceed by telling you, gentlemen and my sisters, that this discussion does not need to be polarized. It is not a discussion between Dr. Abdul Aziz Salamahullah and Asghar Amin Jafar. It is a discussion on our faith. And while Dr. Abdul Aziz Sallamahullah has said that he believes in Imam Ajjalallahu Farajahu Sharif, I have no right whatsoever to disbelieve him. Therefore, when I will speak tonight, I will speak considering him as my brother in faith. And I will tell him if he considers me as my elder brother, as his elder brother, because I am older than him, by only six years. <laughs> Dr. Abdul Aziz was born in 1942, and I took the leave of coming to this earth earlier by six years in 1936. So the age group, the age gap is six years. But this age or gap does not mean anything. You can, you know this, of course, that when Sharif Ravi died at the age of 40, the compiler of Nahj al-Balagha, his brother Sayyid Murtaza said, وَكَمْ مِنْ عُمْرٍ قَصِيرٍ طَاهِرٍ خَيْرٌ مِنْ عُمْرٍ طَالَ بِالْأَدْنَى When some people live for short, short period, but if that life is pure and pious, it is better than a very long Najis life. Now, I differ with Dr. Aziz Sallamullah on matter of principle. That's all. Why should we be concerned whether the Western scholars pay any credence to my faith or not. That is simple. My brother Abdul Aziz Sallamatullah, to prove to them historical fact by the way we have said, correct. To prove unto them certain matters which are matters of history purely, correct. But my brother, even after having written this book as laboriously as you have claimed, 
I can assure you not a single Westerner has been convinced that Mahdi exists or that Mahdi will come. So this labor for whom? Now, I'm getting older. Eh? I believe that I will have to read certain pages, certain paragraphs, in order to justify what I consider a preceding conclusion before the conclusion. I mean, he read from the conclusion. He didn't read what conclusions he had already taken. See, the final conclusion contradicts everything that he wrote before. And that is what I want to prove today. It seems that Dr. Abdul Aziz, Sakadina Salamullah, at once wanted to act as a believer and also as an outsider. At once. And I am not an academician, but I have my feeling that as an objective writer, objectivity. We, all of us, as human beings and Muslims, because I can speak about this because I know that Dr. Abdul Aziz is an academician, Dr. Liaqat Takim is an academician, and lately said Muhammad Razavi is an academician. Now. I know this, because mashallah they are going to the universities, they have got the degrees, and Hamid Bojani is here before Habib Mawani. He is an academician. And I can see Hussein Kimji there, academician. MashaAllah in Khana Hama of Taubas. The whole house is full of shining sun. But at the same time, let me tell you that objectivity, mark my words, sometimes induces a scholar however a good believer he may be, to enter into an atmosphere of suspended belief, suspended aqidah. There comes a time when the belief is suspended in order to prove that I am being objective. And I fear this, and I am sure that none of the scholars sitting here, including Dr. Abdul Aziz, will ever, ever accept to enter into an atmosphere of suspension of belief. But sometimes you have to, in order to please your examiners, in order to please the masters, in order to get the degree, well, he is a mujahid from the member. And Abdul Aziz, I am sure, does not care about this worldly flourishes. Like myself, he has been through thick and thin, and through fire. Why should he care for pleasing those people who will never be pleased? The question of Aqidah is for Mu'taqideen, not for Kafirin. Now, my English isn't so good. Then I will, I will tell you. Page three. Islamic Messianism introduction al-Mahdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala. Forgive me to say this. I am not equating this work with any other work. But in this book, if I were to read between the lines from page two to three, the prophet is ridiculed, the sahaba are ridiculed, the concept of imamat is ridiculed, and Mahdi is also ridiculed. Now I'm reading it, that even the prophet, as if the sahaba did not understand who Muhammad ibn Abdullah, salawatullah salam,
page two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I start from line seven upward. Muhammad was not only the founder of a new religion, but also the guardian of a new social order. His message embodied in the Quran provided tremendous spiritual as well as socio-political impetus for the creation of a cosmopolitan, just society. Consequently, in the years following the Prophet's death, a group of Muslims emerged who, dissatisfied with the state of affairs under the Khilafah, looked backward to the early period of Islam, which was dominated by the brilliant figure of Muhammad, the prophet and the statesman, and which came to be regarded as the only ideal epoch in Islamic history, unadulterated by the corrupt and worldly rulers of the expanding Islamic empire. This idealization of the prophet, according to these lines, the idealization took place after the prophet's death. That means when Muhammad was alive, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari and Salman al-Farsi and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Miqdad and Ammar al-Yasir did not understand who he was. While just now Dr. Muhammad Abdul Aziz sallallahu just now has said that Muhammad to all of us was an extraordinary man. Just now. If he was an ex extraordinary man. Is that idealization after his death? Now, 20 centuries later? What happened to the Sahaba who were there? This idealization of the Prophet himself gave rise to the notion of his being something more than an ordinary man. What? So this came later, after his death? I take great exception to these lines because I know that Dr. Abdul Aziz does not believe in what he has written. You have to write what you believe and you have to believe in what you write. He doesn't believe in this. He asked him, he is here. What does he believe? He said he, even Ilm al Ghaib is there with the Prophet to predict end. Quran spoke so gloriously about the Prophet. I don't have to speak these words before the scholars, for I am the smallest of all of them. They have higher qualifications than I don't have any qualifications. Therefore, I will I, 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 I'll seek your pardon for speaking these things, but I'm speaking for my for my brothers and sisters. That Sayyidina Ahmadullah Jazairi writes in, in Zuharul Rabi' and in many other places that Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked after the death of the Prophet to describe our Prophet, describe his personality. And the answer he gave, he said, Quran is the personality of the Prophet. And he said, that there is one verse in Quran which speaks everything about the Prophet when Allah says, Inna Now when the ayah was revealed and the Sahaba were there and they knew, and they knew who Muhammad was, what is this idealization which gave an idea that he was more than an ordinary man? Now what happened after the idealization? He must have been divinely chosen. That means the realization came afterwards, after his passing away. I wept when I read this because I believe that Dr. Aziz does not believe in this. He believes that everything was there and Ammar and, 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 and Miqdad and Salman and Abu Dhar and everyone believed in the Prophet to be a divinely sent person as we do today. Why please those people? Just for objectivity? Well, 
and now what happened because the idealization took after the death he must have been divinely chosen and hence the true leader who could guide his people to salvation owing to the feeling of this special status of the prophet some of his followers began to look forward to the rule of an individual from among his descendants whose name also will be muhammad whose kunya will also be like that of the apostle of god and who will fill the earth with equity and justice as it has been filled with injustice oppression and tyranny you see now as a result although the concept of islamic salvation as taught by the quran had not envisaged the appearance of the redeemer mahdi to guide the community of the believers to the pristine islam in the last days it was in all probability the personal devotion of the faithful to the prophet that made them await the coming or advent of a divinely guided savior from his family just now we heard dr sahib sallallahu repeatedly saying that it is from quran it is from quran it is from what is this see dr sahib has been through his research distinguishing between al mahdi and the other appellations like qaimuna wa hujjatuna and all that what i want to submit is and because he is ahlul ilm and ulama are here that in ilm khususan in falsafa before falsafa in usul al fiqh there is one which is called wada ta'ayyuni and one which is called wada ta'ayyini correct mahdi is a wada ta'ayyuni with takhsis it is a name and hujja and mahd qaim ar ta'yini means that is adjective that is why you get idafa in the qaimuna sayqum hujjatuna sayqum but when it comes to mahdi sunni scholars have written and so have shia when the prophet said ya fatima innal mahdiya minki in al mahdiya min o fatima mahdi will be born of you how many ahadis i don't have to you see i have a son whose name is muhsin that is ism wada ta'ayyuni but when i sit and say maro mitho kya se that mitho refers to muhsin but muhsin is ta'ayyuni mitho my sweet heart my sweet child is not ta'ayuni is ta'ayini meaning the same thing hujja and qaim is ta'ayini mahdi is ta'ayuni you can't refute it it is there in the bulk of a hadith and i'm glad that see that is iman which is working that when ibrahim amin ayatullah rang me up about this kitab which you have just mentioned dad gustar jahani which you have translated and he also introduction has been written by you a translator's introduction you have mentioned you have mentioned that jahabini islami world view of islam requires that there be an not only the last era but the continuous era of equity and justice correct not only the last days this is why if you see the ayah la yastakhlifannahum fil ardi kama stakhlafa alladhina min qablihim ha wa yumakkin lahum deenahum alladhi irtada lahum ayah of quran there ayatullah puya right that while this talks of the last days it also talks of the current days if the khilafat would have gone according to shia faith then this aya would have prevailed all the way through up to imam zaman ajrullah
No. Why? Why please these people who shall never be pleased? Prophethood, now, according to my small mind, is in question. Because all that we speak about Prophet and his excellence and his virtues, due to these lines which have been written in this book, it seems, came later. It was realized by the people later. It is, however, significant to note that Jafar Sadiq has been greatly responsible for the moderation and disciplining of radical elements among the Shiites. And he was, in all probability, the person who provided Shiism with a sectarian ideology as well as distinguishing mark of being Jafar. And under Imam Jafar Sadiq, The, the Shiit doctrine of Imamat was formulated. So then, what, what happened in Imam al-Baqir's time, Imam al-Mahzan al-Abidin's time? Achha. Now, what is the meaning of that formulation? The meaning of that formulation is, later on, Dr. Abdul Aziz writes. I'll give you the page if I remember. Page 18. What is the meaning of what happened? See how it was formulated. Because an imam is an imam. As early as Ghadir, he knows, and all of you know, but he knows better, and so does Sayyid Muhammad, Dama Villu, and Dr. Ilyas Sayyid Hafazahullah. They all know. What did Hassan bin Thabit say? Because what is important is that what I am talking today in the broken language of English is exactly to be construed according to what my contemporaries have understood. Right? Lughat al-Sudur. You see, what you understood is important while you listen to me. When the Prophet said, Man kuntu mawlahu, Fahada Aliyun Mawla. Hassan bin Thabit stood up and said, Allow me to say, Ya Ali, you have been appointed Imaman Wahadiya. The word was used as Imam. It is there. In any case, <coughs> what happened? The most dangerous thing is that the non believers can exploit this to the maximum. And the believers will never believe. Right. The belief, page 18, last lines. The belief in the hidden Messiah was a clear shift in the Imam's temporal role as it had been stressed so far. The Imams were now believed to possess divine knowledge now. Now, as formulation took place, they were now believed to be having divine knowledge, which enabled them to predict future events, including the proper time for the Messianic Imam to strike. The highly speculative aspects of the doctrine of the Imamat should be attributed to the circumstances in which the Imams manifested political quietism but did not object to certain extravagant claims made for them by their fanatical associates. What does this claim include? These claims included the possession of esoteric knowledge, ta'wilat, inherited through designation by the imam, 
Later on, the very question of designation became one of the pillars of the Imamite doctrine of Imamat. That means nafs jali or nafs sari, according to this li these lines, is a later on development because later on it became, or was it nafs jali as a, as a prerequisite right from Ali ibn Abi Talib onwards because every Imam who must make a nafs jali about the following Imam. And the beauty is that Dr. Aziz has written extensively about Nasr Sarih and Nasr Jali afterwards. Why write these things then? So what has happened is that the conclusions have been drawn in such an academic way that the reader who is a Yahudi or a Christian says, ah, for the first time there is a Muslim scholar who understands. Then at the end you write a conclusion. A conclusion I have read full. And had it not been for the conclusion, I would not have come here, Dr. Saad, because I would have had to face a kafir, a murtad. But I am facing a mu'min. I have read the doctrine. Dr. Abdul Aziz. I wonder whether you have this or you don't, but I have. This is the doctrine. By Dr. Abdul Aziz, Hafizullah, the doctrine of Mahdism in Imam Shi'ism. First page, introduction. The belief in the Mahdism of the 12th Imam may well in large measure have been the outcome of the prolonged occultation of this Imam, who was initially supposed to reappear shortly after he had disappeared. See what we are writing. True, true, that Kulaini, Hafadahullah, I can't forget his ihsan. And Dr. Abdul Aziz Hafizullah has spoken highly of him. And all will speak. Kulaini has not mentioned Sura and Kubra Ghaibat. But he could not have mentioned because he was in 329 Hijra. And with his death in the same a year, Ghaibat Sura ended. How can he write of Ghaibat Kubra when he is in the same age? I mean, this is, I think, a very simple thing to understand. In spite of that, bring Usul Kafi, I will show you 100 ahadith quoted by Kulaini on Mahdawiyyat and Ghaibah. That means, Dr. Aziz, Allah wants these people to believe that the Shias were told that, look, Imam is coming. In a jiffy. And he didn't come. So there was perplexity, what is called Hayra. And that era of Hayra is Sheikh Sadiq Ali Rahma Ibn Babaway hints to that about Ummiyun in Hayra. And therefore, the ulama then maneuver the hadith in such a way that it became applicable for Tulani Ghaiba, Ghaiba to prolong, so that now no one can forecast and no one can predict. I have. I have books here. I will read, inshallah. <coughs> Again, I repeat, what pains me here is that Dr. Abdul Aziz does not believe in what he has written. He is a Pakka Shia Ibn Asim. 
Why? Just to, just to, just to please, you see? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi The belief in the Mahdism of 12th Imam may well in large measure have been the outcome of the prolonged occultation of this Imam who was initially supposed to reappear shortly after he had disappeared to avenge the wrongs committed against the family of the Prophet and establish the rule of justice. But this hope in the early return of the Imam resulted in disappointment for the Imamites because the Imam was reported to have entered complete occultation and the knowledge of the time when he would reappear was only with God. The Imamite leader at that time, leaders at that time, who were believed to have been directly designated by the Imam himself, may have, this is perhaps Nawab Arba, because designation is only for Nawab Arba, may have prudently combined the idea of the Imam in occultation with the traditions then in circulation, traditions attributed to the Prophet about the future appearance of the restorer of the faith, Al-Mahdi, at any rate they proclaimed the 12th Imam to be that promised Mahdi who would appear at the end of time when there would be violent upheavals, plague and many other natural catastrophes and most importantly when there would occur a general defection from God and his religion. So it is an evolution, an aqidah based on not facts, but supposition. Now, when I read his book, in Urdu they say, chaatte hain kitab ko, chaatte means you lick it. I have read this three times. And page eight, that's all, I, I've got very few books with me, don't know. Now here he has said that these leaders who were designated by the Imam, they combined the hadith of the Prophet uh, and they evolved a, a, a system and an idea. Now here, Agha says, there, so, there seems to be very little reason to believe that the Prophet himself during his lifetime encouraged an idea of Mahdi, future restorer of faith Mahdi. Here it is. Moreover, although the Quran speaks, so much about Huda and Had, it does not advance an idea of such a messianic figure who would appear in future as the divinely guided leader and deliverer of Ummah. Right? And then he says further, it is here. There seems to be also little reason for supposing that the Prophet contemplated the appearance of a Mahdi. Although numerous traditions are attributed to him, regarding the future coming of a deliverer, which should probably be treated as fabrication. So, Mahdi as Quran rafto ham as hadith rafto. You see, both, because this is now gone. What has remained is a concoction of the people there. Now, this is a very plausible objective study. When you want to write objectively, this is how you write. This is how you write. Now, it is true that very few of us go and speak to the university. I have had a chance of speaking to the university. And sometimes, you know, in Gujarati they say, Banelo beat bule. You see, when very highly educated people like Dr. Abdul Aziz, Hafadahullah, and Dr. Liaqat, Sallamullah, or Mawlana al Muhtaram, Damazillu, they go, they, they are different people. When we go, we speak at that level. I had very few things to tell. I said, it was in convent school where all these Catholic nuns and Catholic priests and padres from the hierarchy there in Mombasa upwards till the late, the last one. They were present. And they said, you want to know about Islam? We spoke about the life of this prophet. 
Now, for everything that the Prophet did, they had an objection. If he married nine wives, how do they look at it? That he was a sensuous, permissive man. If he lifted his sword, that he was always on the offense. Right? I mean, you know, such stuff. Check the book by them and see on every, at every page, on every step, their interpretation is always mutilated. They always like to see the Prophet in a different, because they have no aqidah. Ah. So I said, now nah, look, Jesus Christ said, whoever strikes you on the right, lend him your left. Did he say that? Oh yes, he said. I said, fine. What happened when Jesus Christ entered the temple and he saw the money lenders, the sharks of those days, who were fleecing the poor people. He actually overturned their table and manhandled them and removed them out of the temple. A man who says, whoever hits you here, give him here. Manhandles those people and actually overturns the table and kicks them out of the temple. How can you reconcile the two? Oh, they said, that is spiritual. I said, I wish you looked at Muhammad spiritually. You see? If he married, when did he marry? At what age he married? Who he married? Analyze and see. Do you see sensuous and sexual propensity? If he raised his sword, do you see anything but defense or preemption? Tell me, but a man, Azizam, brother, my brother Azizam, okay. a man who does not want to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can you persuade him to believe in Mahdi? Huh? So the book I read, and I mean, I have. Mr. President, I'm thirsty. <laughs> but Dr. Abdul Aziz, just for you to be able to distinguish the color, you can see how many places I have highlighted. And this is a total flag of how many pages I have highlighted. Not to prove that you are wrong, huh? to prove that you have tried to please those who shall never be pleased. And thus, you have rendered yourself indefensible. Much as you speak, no, you are one of us. Mimba needs you, needs you, needs all of you. Speak that which goes according to Aqidah for the people of Aqidah. Remember, needs you. You have a, you, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you gift of eloquence. You are a master of several languages. Your understanding is so good. You are so incisive, so analytic. You see, and you are so modern in your outlook. In fact, you are now postmodern in your outlook. I have read this, your interview, and I have also read your translation. I hope it was by you, yourself. And in that translation, there are certain omissions. What appears in Farsi does not appear in English. But I concede it must be by inadvertence. But they are very important omissions. <laughs> yes, they are very important omissions. In your letter to Hujat al Islam al Muslimin. Mawlana Sayyid Akhtar Radhavi, Hafadahullah, 
you have made a very important point according to you that knowledge taghir padir asto ilm haqaiq taghir padir nistan sahi the religious truth does not change knowledge changes dr sahab this applies to tarikh not to aqeeda aqeed is there now you i can prove i can prove no. uh, a son was born in my household in 1964 you can all sit and prove that he was never born but no, he is born is in my house But scholastically, there are all weak arguments. You can't prove. Aqaid, as you said rightly, aqaid is by the people who believe in it, not by the scholars who sit at the university. They might not find, and you know, that as you said rightly, there is a manhajasi, manhajadirasi. There is a nahaj, which is a scientific methodology followed by the ulama. That, of course, is certain. Now, let us take example. I sent you a book. I, I hope you have received that. Subverting Islam by Ahmad Warab. I sent to you also, Dr. Ali. Ah, you also received. I sent to all the scholars, <laughs> Hamid, Sallallahu I sent this to show how the enemies are working against us. All of them. Ahmad Warab is a professor from Saudi, Saudi. Now you know that you must be knowing. You must be knowing better than I do. That in School of Oriental and African Studies, London, they have started. an islamic class called islamic studies to prove that quran is interpolated muharraf tahrif that means some changes have been made yeah yes listen listen this and supported by selyok in birmingham selyok school of oriental and african studies right now what i was trying to tell you is this that there is a manhaj as far as our ulama are concerned right agha khui has proved that there is no change in quran by the argument of tawatur correct agha is it not correct that is what i have understood that tawatur means right from the a day of the prophet spoke that ayah till today there has been no change in the transmission of aya it is called tawatur and i spoke to them and said we don't accept your system now what shall we do they don't want to accept our system you tell him that this hadith may be zaif by isnad but if there is another hadith which supports it we will accept it they don't accept it tarikh You talk to them about mubahila. Will they accept it? That mubahila occurred between Christians and the Prophet. Will they accept? They don't because they don't have any source. So there are so many things where they will disbelieve. It does not harm our belief, and we should not allow that to be. You see, the question is that that knowledge which you are talking about is something else. But that which is connected with aqida, it is to be pursued differently. What you have mentioned in Farsi, and you have missed out here, is just for your attention. That's all. Maybe it is. I can see it can be either typing error or whatever. Where you say that in Jamiha Hambugu Yam, Mu'taqid ba Imamatu Imam Sahib Zaman Hasan. به خاطر این است که هیچ وقت در کتاب هایم بحث امامت را مطرح نکرد من از روز اول امامت و رسالت را ثابت شده گرفتم و قرآن را وحی خداوند گرفتم و در کتاب, در کتاب بحث نکرد این را اصل گرفتم You haven't said this in English because you have discussed imamat in this book although you say you haven't but in this book you have discussed imam and i have a feeling that maybe this was inadvertently left out yes yes please you just uh, because that interview by the way was not correctly reported 
therefore there were so many errors, so many, so many things that I had to check for them. Because I did not have the problem. So, so it's... So the Farsi one seems to be, Farsi, Farsi one seems to be incorrect. In any case, whatever be the case. But I hope that it is understood that you have discussed Imamat at length. Now, before I conclude, because there are many books now, but I should conclude. It's 11 o'clock, Mr. President. I'm conscious of the time. Finally, this book, Ghaibato Mahdawiyyat, Dar Tashayyu'i Imamiyyat. Now, I don't know, Dr. Saib, but in your Farsi interview, you have mentioned one of those collaborators and colleagues who usually helped you in your investigations and research was Iftikhar Zadeh. Is he Muhammad Rida Iftikhar Zadeh or somebody else? Now, this is a book where Mahmoud revived the Kharzad. He doesn't mention whose book he is translating. But it is a comparative study of Jasim Hussein and Dr. Satyadina, and it must be Dr. Liyakat Takim's book. But his name is not there. Huh? But it is yours. You haven't, you haven't read this. Sorry, Mr. President, it is now inadmissible because he hasn't read it, so I can't say anything. I cannot say anything because you haven't seen it. When, once when you see it, then I will speak about it. No, I haven't seen the English one. I have seen this. If it is not seen by you, then I cannot, it is inadmissible evidence. No, really, I have got to be just and fair because I say something and tomorrow you just now stand up and say Managuftam, But you have supported Dr. Sachedina. If this is if this is exactly yours, and if the translation is rather than doing him a good turn, this book is doing him a bad turn. Because Dr. Sachedina doesn't believe in those things. He believes in Mahdi alayhi salam. And he believes that the one who is at the, in the concealment is the son of Imam Hassan Askari alayhi salam, who was born on 255 Hijrah. Right, Agha? Why should we, in a comparison between Dr. Jasim Hussain, who is neither Nabi nor a prophet, in order to bring out salient points, which sometimes even Aghay Mahmoud Iftikhar Zadeh in his footnotes had to be very severe about things. As a critic, he has a right, but not to that extent because Dr. Aziz does not deserve that sort of thing, for he is a Mu'taqid. And therefore, as a very humble servant of this community and as a good friend and as an admirer of all the scholars of our community, may Allah grant them long lives and grant them tawfiq to serve. I only want one thing, that's all. That Dr. Aziz has said what is his faith. From now onwards, please, Dr. Sahib, this is my request. You may like it, you may not like it. As you said, you may throw it away. Please stop defending your book. It has been written. It has gone into the end. Please don't defend it. We will keep quiet. Promise. In this Hussaini. You keep quiet. Don't say about research and methodology. For we have our research also, and Imam al zamanas subject requires a separate research, not this research. Therefore, your research itself has got to be researched. So stop it. Don't defend. We will not call upon you to defend. And we will not touch it again.
Okay? And start afresh. There is no reason and there was no preoccupied concept of humiliating anyone. Allah. Shahidan min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that was the thing, I would not have come. For I am a human being also, not a masoom. And to humiliate a mu'min is a gunah kabira. We have come here as friends and we have come here as brothers. You stop defending the book, we stop talking about the book. And we start afresh on the basis that we have a brother who believes in Mahdi al-Muntadr Allah Maulana Muhammad Rizvi will now address us. Bar Muhammad in Wale Muhammad Salwat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللهين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد والأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سيما على حجة القائم المحدي المنتظر When I was informed about this open forum I was undecided till yesterday whether I'm going to come or not But finally thinking over it looking at the aspect of our community it's an issue which has divided our community here and you can feel the division in views and its waves up to Hausa Ilmi of Qom I was here from the very beginning of the meeting and I had the opportunity to hear Dr. Abdulaziz Sachidina and also Mullah Sahib. I don't have really much to say after listening to both of them, but there are a few points which I thought were necessary and they should be mentioned. And this is really coming after, out of sincerity, I think. The community knows me, the respected guests here. They know me. It's really out of the sense of duty and obligation. Otherwise, I don't have any, anything to gain or to lose by being here. I had a full right to stay at home. Let me begin with the whole issue that, although the book has been around for quite a few years, but I really never got around reading it until two days ago. I had read different parts, just glance here and there at various times, but I did not go through the book in detail. And when I started reading it last night, I had just finished the first two chapters. <clears throat> as far as the other side of this issue, which is even relevant to there also I felt the tension on one side you have Ayatollah Safi Gulpaigani. He has one feeling on this issue, although he's a very close friend of Dr. Aziz Sachidina. He knows him for quite a long time. And even on the critique which he wrote on his book, he has praised him in the, in the preface of that. On the other side there you have Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini who has been in touch with me for the last four months on this issue, especially the translation of his book done by Dr. Abdulaziz Sachedina. Uh, last Sunday he phoned me, informing that he had finished the translation of the book, and he was kind enough to even fax me the 
translator's introduction or preface I have here with me. When I read the translator's introduction, it was pleasing to know that the beginning, at the very beginning of the introduction at the end, Dr. Sachedina has very clearly stated his faith, which he also did here tonight. And I'll just read the last line here. To all of them I have dedicated the translation of this valuable statement of my personal faith. It is the book of Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini. I think Dr. Oyman talked about the book here. But then I read the book last night, and there's a paragraph here which I would like to read with your permission because it's not yet printed, from page three of the translator's introduction, where Dr. Saab writes, my endeavors in Islamic Messianism were very much guided by the need to present the Shiite school of thought to the Western academic world, dominated by the Orientalist scholarship that not only marginalizes Shiism as deviant and corrupt form of Islam, it regards it as directly influenced by Jewish and Christian ideas about the Messiah and Zoroastrian Iranian belief in the future savior of mankind. It was important for my research to challenge the long-held conclusions of the Western and Sunni scholars and assert with confidence that the idea of the future coming of the Mahdi originated from the Quranic worldview about a just and ethical society. On the other hand, Ayatollah Amini's exposition in Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, the just leader of humanity, is geared towards responding to the skepticism and doubts raised by the educated Shias, the Sunnis, and even the Babi and Baha'i readers of his work. And what I sense from this is that it seems our respected doctor is saying that the objective of writing the book Islamic uh, Messianism and the book of Ayatollah Amini perceive the same objective, but the methods are different and the audience are different. You are writing for non-Muslims, he is writing for the Muslim audience. <clears throat> I understood when you said here in the beginning you reaffirm your faith in, in Imam al-Zamana Jalallahu Ta'ala Farajul Sharif. And you talked about the environment in which you did your research and wrote your book. I can understand that because I also been to some extent through that system. But what I would like to really, after reading the book, and as I said, I'm going to talk about that later on, I would just make one request, which is my understanding of the issue and the problem. Is that it's true that the methodology of research in the Western academia is very different from ours. And I think people like you in the position of a established professor of Islamic studies in a university, now you don't ever fear for your position. You are there established. I think it's time people like you in that position should move towards challenging the methodology used for studying Christianity and Judaism, the biblical textual criticism. Now again, I have a problem that I don't even know whether this audience and the forum is right to go into details of these issues. But I think it's time that we challenge that method that when you come and study Islam, you cannot study the Quran like you would study the Bible. Because even according to the beliefs of the Christians, the gospel, for example, was written by John or Luke or Matthew, not a revelation in a sense, although they believe that the Holy Ghost was there guiding them in dictation of whatever they were doing. And we have a very different view about the Quran as a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think it, it's a re really big challenge and a responsibility for people in, in that position like you and others that you should really come up and try to present because I looked at the book and when I read the first two chapters, I would like you to clarify one thing for me and think that clarification would really go a long way in at least settling the issue for myself. People are free to understand what they want. But as you have said, you know, nobody's book is uh, sacred. Even the book of our great Olama is not sacred. It's open to criticism. And I'm sure you would agree that even your book is not sacred and it's open to criticism. And 
when I read the first chapter, I just sat down this evening to put down some of the notes and observations on first chapter. I have about five pages. I'm not going to discuss this here. I might, inshallah, give you if you like. And to look at it, <coughs> but what I would say is that when I see some of your other writings, and when I see this book written in, or published in the 70s, mid-70s, I see there are probably two different such adinas, one of early 70s and one of mid-90s. What I would like to be reconciled for myself is, you know, uh, to explain these uh, differences. Maybe there has been a growth because people, after all, through their age and study and education and research, grow and develop their thoughts and ideas very differently. I'll just mention, there is one point which Mullah Sahib brought up about the Prophet. I'll just mention one point because I don't want to take much time, although I understand this can go until tomorrow. <laughs> For example, this is about the early few pages. Page 4, where you're talking about uh, the idea of uh, Messianism and Mahdism, where you're talking about the civil war which started among the Muslims after the murder of the third Khalifa, where you say, and the civil war broke out after the murder of Muhammad's third successor, in A.D. 656, the Muslims were confronted with an unfulfilled idea of a just order, which gave rise to a discussion of the necessity of a qualified leadership to assume the imamate of the Ummah, on whom depended the establishment of a true Islamic order. Most of these early discussions on the imamate took at first sight political form, but eventually the debate encompassed the religious implication of salvation. This is true of all Islamic concepts, since Islam is a religious phenomenon, was subject to Islam as a political reality. Now, see, the thing which I would like to reconcile and really see, Dr. Sachedina, who has translated Ibrahim Amini's book and things you have written here, and when I see that, I think it will go a long way in trying to dispel the misunderstanding if later on you can come and clarify this that, for example, we do not believe that Shiaism is something which started after the era of Osman's murder. And that also is a political movement which later on takes on a religious form. No, it was a religious movement from the very, very beginning. And to say, or the way the words imply, is basically the same idea with the Orientalists and Sunnis have been saying against us for so many centuries. And this goes against when I was reading your article which was published on occasion of Ghadir Khum by Toronto Jamaat in 1990. And I'll just read apart from that. The proclamation of the Prophet on that occasion of Ghadir Khum gave rise to the tension between the ideal leadership promoted through the Vilaya of Ali bin Abi Talib and the real, which means historical one, precipitated by human forces to suppress the purpose of Allah on the earth. And so there the concept of Vilat and Imamat goes to the days of the Prophet in the event of Ghadir Khum and not something which started after the murder of Usman. So there are two different, apparently two different views here from the same pen and same author. So what will really satisfy me and I hope it will uh, go a long way in trying to end all this misunderstanding would be to maybe, you know, explain these differences, or are we talking about Dr. Abdulaziz Sachedina in 1976, a different person, and Dr. Abdulaziz Sachedina sitting here is an evolved person, different from what he was in the 70s. And I think that this will go a long way in trying to display, dispel whatever problem that we have on our own levels as well as on the community level, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dr. Liaqat Takim has changed his mind. He will address us and after that we'll have some tea. Hawzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Assalamu alaikum. 
I know it's getting very late, and I will be brief, I promise you, um, because there are one or two points I think that do need clarification. Um, Mullah Sahib did say and talk about suspension of belief. I can assure you that suspension of belief does not mean that you literally suspend your belief, you stop believing. Because any mu'min, for even a split of a second, if he stops believing, he becomes a kafir. We know that. Therefore, there is no question of suspending your belief in the sense that you stop believing. Because a mu'min is a mu'min from the time he is born, from the time he embraced his faith, to the time that he dies. I should also clarify one other point, uh, that people seem to have this misconception that uh, we write PhDs or we do these things for the sake of pleasing the examiners, etc. And I can only talk about my own personal experiences. My own personal experience when I was writing my PhD, it was in SOAS in London, was that there were many a time whereby I disagreed with my supervisor, he told me that he disagreed with me, he wasn't sure whether I would, my thesis would be accepted, but I said that I can defend it. As a PhD student, the supervisor, the most he can guide you. He plays no part in the examination. He may be, he might be there, he may not be there, but he, even if he is there, he's completely silent during the examination. You can write what you like, provided you are prepared to and able to defend what you write. Use the right methodology and convince the examiners of what you are writing, and it will be accepted. So there is no question, the way that I have seen it, that of writing something for the sake of pleasing an examiner or pleasing a supervisor. As I said, we write it, provided you can defend it. And as I said, personally, there were many a time whereby I openly disagreed with my supervisor, and he said, well, provided you can defend it, good luck to you. Uh, one other point about this book of, uh, that the Mullah Sahib brought out, it is a thesis which I had written 13, 14 years ago, the reason why I was so astonished was because I had never seen it myself. So the first time, in, in Farsi, I mean, I was contacted and I was told they were going to translate it. I said, at least send me, before publishing, send it to the Persian version so I can make sure that the translation is proper and faithful to the English. And this is the first time that I've actually seen it. That is why I was a bit unhappy about it, because I felt that at least, the least they could have done is to send me a copy of it, if not before publishing, at least after publishing it. However, I should also add finally that uh, we as a community in North America do realize the importance of Dr. Abdulaziz Sachedina, the important role that he can play for us as Shia Muslims in North America. And I hope that uh, finally we'll be able to resolve this issue and we can tackle new challenges that face all of us living in the West, here in North America, in Europe, in the West in general. There are so many other challenges that you all know about that we face as Muslims. And I think that it's time, once and for all, we brought an end to this, this uh, controversy so that we can go ahead and carry on and face the new challenges that we face all the time. Wassalamu alaikum wa I, uh, I had mentioned before that we would uh, discuss this as to how far or how late into the night that we want to go today. Um, Personally, I do see some light at the end of the tunnel on this particular matter. And um, if everybody is agreeable, perhaps after the tea break we should continue. But if it is generally felt that maybe we should uh, adjourn and start tomorrow, uh, then perhaps we should do that. What is the general feeling? Is, continue? is that okay? Shall we continue after the tea break? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Will everybody please remain seated? Tea will be served where you are, and after that we will continue. There have been some clarifications seeked from Brother Abdulaziz, Dr. Abdulaziz Sachedina. I'm sure there are some of you who have some questions and some comments to make, but I think before us is an opportunity here to resolve this matter once and for all. Well, I will now ask Brother Abdulaziz Sachedina to come and make comments and give clarifications on questions that he has been asked by Maulana Rizvi especially. And after that, the floor will be open. I would request once again, all of you who wish to make comments or to ask questions, please restrict yourself to the subject matter. Mullah Asghar has already been through the book. He has raised a number of issues and I'm sure that some of the issues that you may want to raise have been covered by him. So let's make sure or let's ensure that 
time is not wasted. Make comments on the subject matter. Please don't be pers do not be personal because I would let not allow the question or the comment if it is of a personal or an irrelevant nature. Brother Abdul Aziz. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim I think uh, enough ground has been covered to respond to the questions and the concerns that we you all have I think it's worth remembering that and worth recalling that in 1983 when I met Mullah Sai for the first time with my brother-in-law Abdul Hussein Takim in his house in London and we discussed the book at that time Mullah Sai very sincerely and honestly advised me that the book should not be discussed in public. And he always consistently maintained that the subject matter of the book, we went line by line together in 1983. Mullah Sahib had just come out of the prison in Iraq. And there was a problem in Birmingham because they had, invi they had invited me for Muharram and they were told that I could not address the Muharram because I had written such a book. And Mullah Sahib in in intervened and told them that no, that was not the case. In some, we have a situation And that situation is defending an issue has not been, especially the book, has not been my concern, at least in all these years. I've not done it in public. I've not tried to do it on the public. In fact, there have been several times when I have, people have asked me to meet with me. Sometimes I've met with them, sometimes I've not been able to meet with them. But I have avoided public discussion and debate about the book because of the way it can be read and the way it can be construed. And public forum sometimes is not the right forum for academic discussions. An ideal situation would have been several scholars in the field, sitting together, discussing the issues one by one and seeking clarification. I think people have right to seek clar clarification. But there are certain limitations that we all recognize. So I'm, I'm not, as I mentioned today, that I'm not there to defend. I wanted to simply for you to appreciate what we do in the academia and we're not, we're not selling ourselves off. Aqeedah also evolves and I'm talking about the knowledge of the Aqeedah. The way Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, understood Tawheed. We don't understand the same way Tawheed. Our Tawheed is influenced by our own times, the way we see things, the way we have lived the life. Our experiences, in other words, have that impact upon the way we analyze issues, we understand issues, even related to our closest aqidah. And I don't see a problem there at all. I think an important issue that should be recognized is that religious knowledge grows. And this brings me to Dr. Uh, Molana Rizwi's point here, that yes, indeed, 
Islamic Messianism is like any other book. It's not a categorical statement, nor is it a statement of what we call a perfection in methodology, nor is it a statement in even understanding the religious and the political. I was very much influenced, by the way, when, when I say Islam began as a political reality. And then it, it adopted. This is very much the influence of the Christian studies. It's biblical studies, whereby you talk about Jesus in, in a very political manner, and then you talk about the theological issues and systematic theology. If you open a book of Kalam, that's what it shows. And my book is not an exception. It is another example of a scholarly attempt. It is an attempt and never absolute and never categorical. We stand to be corrected. And there's no scholar. If you study five different works of Sheikh Tusi, in five different works, he comes to different conclusions about different fatawas. And it shows Sheikh Tusi's own evolution of understanding issues. So when one author writes, you have not even studied my book on the, the, the just ruler in Shiite Islam. You are so much concerned with the first book that you have not even moved forward to see what else has he written. Because there I actually explore the possibilities of coming to terms with some of the conclusions that I derive. And those conclusions, however academic and however they are problematic, and those problematic should be corrected in different ways or should be addressed in different ways. In other words, there is an evolution. Abdul Aziz Sachedina in 1995 is not the same Abdul Aziz Sachedina in 1975 because he has learned many things that he did not know and he's still learning things. What is important to remember is that we are not in porn in the universities. We are not trying to please anyone in the universities. We are not trying to please. There is, there is no... You think God cannot provide for me my daily meal if I did not work in a university? Like many of you, I can be a sweeper if I want on the street. I can be garbage collector. So what's wrong in that? Why should I be in the university? I'm not trying to please. In fact, the university regards me as an apologetic for Islam. University of Virginia, Georgetown University and all other universities know they interpret it as inquisition tonight, by the way, because the faxes come to my office. I don't have a private office. My secretaries, our secretaries, they're looking at the things that are going on. So the question I was asked by the chairman, would you come and explain what's happening? So I told him, well, my community has a right to, to ask from me. And simply they're questioning me what I'm writing. Would you convey to them something, he tells me, would you convey to them that we do appreciate and we learn, we have learned so much about Islam because you are representing an apologetic tradition. That means you are not completely discounting the tradition as a whole. So we have a role to play and we can't pull ourselves off the universities. We don't have masters to please. Wallahi, we don't have masters. My, my only ma mistress whom I want to please is Fatima Zahra Salamu Alayha. I want that lady to be pleased. Because from the age of 13, now I'm 53 years old, I have always served that lady. Serving Imam Hussain is serving her. And the only reason that I really would like to share with you what we go through in the universities, and many a times, believe it or not, we are tested. I get a call from CIA. Dr. Sachidina, we want you to come and teach Sharia. CIA? Sharia? What are they doing about, with the Sharia? Oh, you wonder what should you do? And they tell you very clearly. They call you up and they tell you, we'll pay you in cash. Nobody will know that we've paid you. How do you do with your own conscience? We have conscience to reply to. We have God to reply to. Such offers are made by the State Department, by the ministries. Come and talk to us about it. And of course, there's a lot of money involved. For each lecture that you give, you, give, you receive $2,000, $1,000, sometimes $3,000. Who wants to give up that kind of money? If we were sellouts, we would have done it very easily. But we have conscience. We have a responsibility. 
And therefore, I would not like to offer any kind of categorical statement about my book, nor am I interested in defending it, because I know there's an academic work and it will remain academic work. By the way, I have evolved. Quotation by the Mullah Sahib on, the, on my dissertation is not appropriate. My dissertation has been surpassed by my book. When you write a dissertation, you revise it. You throw out things that you, your supervisors wanted to see it. And my supervisors were that British, old British guard. They said, Sachadina, you must write this. This is too tendentious. This is very defensive. They will throw things at me. I remember taking my first chapter to my, my supervisor and said, this is tendentious. That means you are defending Islam. So I had to go back and rewrite what he wanted to write, me to write. That dissertation is not to be cited. Because when you write another work, revising your previous work, the previous work is abrogated. It cannot be cited. And this is what we call a convention in the academia. You correct yourself. You come to the second book, read the just rule in Shiite Islam, and I continue those things. And some of the things that I did not like what I wrote in my first book, I tried to correct it in the third book, in the fourth book. I have written re recently, I was invited in Jerusalem to talk about prevention of deadly violence in Abrahamic religion. I was the only Muslim scholar there. They were all Jews and Christians. I was the only Muslim scholar. And I presented the case very clearly that Islam is not a violent religion. It's a religion that w wants to put moral restrictions on the use of force. So from day one, Islam is very much concerned that it will not use force unless it is necessary to use it. It has to justify it. We are talking about our imams having... In, you know that Shia theory of jihad is very clear that you need a ma'asum to declare jihad. You cannot have a non-ma'asum declaring jihad. Why? Because people's life is in danger. You can't be, put people's life in danger without the imam having that knowledge and that ability to judge the situation. What we are then confronted with is a very complicated world in which we are living. My brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to remain away from the universities at all. If we want to have a say in this country, if we want to have any say in this country, then we will have to have a good dialogical relationship. We don't have to sell out. I don't agree that anybody from us should be writing something that is extremely unacceptable, or at least I would say religiously unacceptable to be written. Yeah, I would not like that to see. But I think that if we grow, and I have grown, I would like, in fact, I am the one who is speaking to the religion department here, Jane McAuliffe, the director of the center, I told her that you have to get Maulana Rizwi to teach the fiqh in the university. He can do it. And I've spoken to the sponsors who are running the program Islam Educa Education because I believe that what Maulana Rizwi can do in the university is unique. Nobody else can do it. And we have to penetrate the university because we need to get in the dialogue with academicians. We are not trying to convert them. Believe it or not, we can't convert our own fellows. You talk to the Sunnis, I give the Jummah khutbah every Jummah among the Sunnis. And I have, the only thing I have achieved in the 20, 15 to 20 years in Charlottesville is that the Sunnis accept Ahlul Bayt in a much easier way because I present Ahlul Bayt. That's the only thing I've been able to change. But they are strictly Sunnis. And some of them are really Wahhabis. You can't, Allah hadima yasha ala salat mustaqim. Who am I to guide? What, I can, what can I do? I'm not writing a book you know, in, in order to convert people. So what we are saying here is that we need to engage. And the more we remain isolated, the more we are overpowered by them. We need an empowerment. And our empowerment can come through our honest, sincere young people who can take up the challenge of standing in the university and talking about these issues and finally be heard by them. And they will not take us lightly. You remember what, what Imam Ali told Abu Dhar? Abu Dhar, Muawiyah doesn't want you. But you are a muttaqi. You are a muttaqi. Your presence is a problem for Muawiyah. And it is just sufficient for him to know that you are around. What I'm saying is that it is sufficient for us to make our presence felt in the universities. 
If we don't do it, somebody else will do a very dirty job. That's what they are doing. The Christians and the Jews who are teaching Islam, who are teaching Islamic studies, have a goal in mind. And that is exactly what Mullah Sahib has pointed out. There's a goal to undermine Islam, to undermine the confidence of Islam, to tell people that this is, oh, he was not even a prophet. But that's exactly what they want to do. And this is what we want to meet. And we have to meet our enemies with their weapons. If we ignore their methods, I'm, I take Mulana Rizwi's suggestion very seriously that we need to tell them that, look, your method has a problem. You can't really describe religion. You can't analyze the religion the way you are teaching us. We will teach you now how to analyze religion. We'll tell you what to do about it. So we should be innovators. We should be the one to tell them this is the right usul, this is the right methodology that we think. But can we do it outside? We can't. They ignore us. Unless we, have, unless we are willing to fight their, the battle on their battlefront with their weapons, the, the weapons they have created, we will not be able to fight the battle at all. So really we are faced with a challenge. And I submit very sincerely very honestly, to all the honest feelings that were expressed by Mullah Asghar at this time. And I have a great respect. I have always respected Mullah Sahib, especially. He has always been my role model. When it came to the member, he was my role model. I have heard him at a very young age. And for therefore, I have a great respect for what he says and the advice that he gives, he gives me. In fact, I also myself believe that Defending anything that is academic in the religious community does not lead to any conclusive uh, results at all. Always these debates are inconclusive, believe it or not. Even if we were to sit the whole night and read page by page, we would reach no conclusion. Why? We are dealing with two different methods of expressing the religious truth and the religious knowledge. Religious knowledge is a different issue. Religious truth is timeless, doesn't change, doesn't go through any kind of modification. It's the truth. It's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That God is the one God, and that doesn't change. You might talk about sifat sabutiya you might talk about sifat salbiya you might talk about the freedom of will, you might talk about different aqaid, everything, but the fact remains, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajaun. That's the fact. And I think this is what we need to, uh, to tell ourselves in the community. The community should be able to resolve these issues in a much amicable way. As I'm saying, I would not have come if I had not been attacked all the time. Not only attacked, I come and they tell me, you can't read the madlis. Okay, you tell me you can't read the madlis on the grounds that you have written this book, which is not acceptable, and therefore we ban you from appearing on the member. I think that if that's the solution that the community wants to follow, then the community has the right to make the decision. I am not gaining anything by working for the community. My only concern is that I'm part of you. You are mine, I'm yours. Whether you accept me or not, you are my family and I am the member of your family. And therefore, there is a need for you to understand our responsibilities. We have academic responsibilities. Either we say that we are not living in this world, we are living in our own insulated community, we don't need to deal with anybody in this world, which is totally false, you all know that. You all know that the moment you move out of this mosque, you are faced with the world that is not always friendly, it is very hostile at times, it is there to undo you, to remove your confidence, to take it away from you. So we are trying to do something that was not possible at all 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think we have to learn from some, from some of our enemies. Let me give you a very short example before I move, before I conclude my remarks here that now we have at least 15 Ismaili students with PhDs who are teaching in American universities. At least 15 of them. They have PhDs from London, from Oxford, from Harvard, from Princeton, in Islam, and believe it or not, some of them even don't know how to read Arabic. Because I have met them, 
They don't even know how to read the texts. They are so weak in their Islamic studies, so to speak. But they are the representatives of Islam in the colleges. And in the colleges today, it's not only, it's, you are not only teaching the Christian and the Jews, you are also teaching your own second generation, third generation Muslims. My class, half of it is Muslim. Other half is Jewish and Christian. So we are dealing with that kind of situation where Ismaili students are now the spokespersons for the Islam in North America. And gradually, I wouldn't be surprised with the Aha Khan support, with what Aha Khan is doing, within no time, they will be at the head of all the departments on Islamic studies because they have the money. Money speaks in America. I'm not telling you to contribute. I have not asked you to create chairs of Islamic studies. In fact, the Mullah Burhan, Sayyid Muhammad Burhanuddin, the Mullah of the Bohra, is in touch with me that he wants to donate a church in Georgetown University. And I have told him that, why in Georgetown University? Why in a Catholic university? Why don't you go in somewhere like the University of Toronto, where there's a large Muslim community that can benefit from the chair? We are really confronted with a situation whereby other communities, you think Mullah, Mullah, this Mullah of the Bohra would have interest to do this if it was not his personal political gain of some sort. There's a political gain there. And I don't mean to say that we should be playing political games, but we have full right to play academic games in their own terms and knowing very well what they do in the universities. By our presence, they are afraid. And I think we should do that at all times and we should try to make all the efforts. I do not want to uh, say that this is the goal that all of us will have. But I'm extremely grateful to all of you for being extremely patient. I think I have tested your patience long enough and the time has come for me to just make this conclusive perhaps proposal. It can be a proposal only and I think we are in agreement and Mullah Sahib and myself we believe that there is a lot that we have covered. I think we have cleared a lot of what I call misconceptions, misunderstanding and those differences of opinion will continue to live. A community thrives when it agrees to disagree. A community thrives when it agrees to disagree in a civil way. I don't think we have to be in insulting or humiliating each other or defaming each other or calling names each other. I think the requirement that we have is that this is what we are supposed to do and this is what we have been able to achieve tonight. At least, in my opinion, I am satisfied that I had this opportunity for the first time and I sought this opportunity merely to make you share my concerns and my feelings towards what we do in the academia and ask your sympathetic understanding. You might not accept us, you might not agree with us, but I think our role is extremely important in the university as much as in the community, especially in North America. May Allah help us to become what he wants us to become as good submitters and not simply Muslims by name. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. the next question is where do we go from here um, basically as I understand it and I stand corrected uh, if I have misunderstood what has been said uh, Mullah Saheb indicated that perhaps time has come for the defensive part of the book to be put behind us or why Dr. Abdulaziz Sachidina to stop defending his book and for us to put what has been said before, to put it in the past and start afresh. That is certainly something before us and from what I could interpret what, uh, what Brother Aziz was saying was that he seems to be agreeing with that. 
What I'm going to do next is to leave it open to the floor. But I sincerely believe that we have something here where misconceptions, misunderstandings have been aired. People have had the opportunity to take things off their chest. They've said what they wanted to say. Time has come for us perhaps to put this entire issue behind us. But it would not be fair for me to deny anybody an opportunity, especially those who have uh, come from far, who want to express an opinion or ask a question relevant to the issue, to give them this opportunity to do that. There have been some questions that have come from the ladies' section. I'm going to go through it to see if the relevance or the irrelevance of it. And now the floor is open. Anybody may make a comment. When you raise your hand and stand up, please identify yourself for the benefit of everybody around you. One, one more interview. Salaamu <laughs> Brothers, as you know, most of you, you know, and whom you don't know, you will know that I am coming from Montreal just for this open floor to join you for this good gesture and good will and good cause. I will be the same alim and a shaitan regime, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam alam and it's about Huda. As everybody has mentioned, particularly Mullah Sahib or Qibla Malana, Rajvi Sahib, Brother Taqim, this is for a reason and a cause to save our future generation. Brothers and sisters in Iman, as Dr. Abdul Aziz has mentioned and recited the holy verse of Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are all coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will go back. Every individual is responsible, whatever he is doing, verbally or in writing, to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are here to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's it. This book, in early 80s, when it comes, I was in Montreal, Marana Ali Muhammad was there, Brother Taqi was there. I spoken up about this from the pulpit, from the member. I'm not denying. The reason is, like Mullah Sahab said, there are many things in this book which is hurting the faith and Iman and Islam. Brother, Dr. Aziz was talking about Tawheed. I will just write, read few lines and you will understand how the Tawheed itself become damaged. What the concept and ideology we are having about Tawheed and what is, has been given indication over here, the 153 page and the bottom, if you go, fifth line, sixth line. The major objection, the day when I have it, you know, Brother Ani Imani, it is written on the title page, the idea of the Mahdi in 12 Shiism. This is not the idea of the Mahdi in 12 Shiism. This is the ideology, philosophy, the work, the hardship of Dr. Aziz. All the 12 words in the universe, in the world, are not having this idea of Islamic Messianism, of Mahdiyat, Mahdaviyat, what I'm telling you. This line should not be here. The place of this line is not be here. It could be written in the book that the views, the philosophy, the thoughts, the ideology, the hard work, of doctor, we no one have single word to say anything about this book. Brother Imani, if you read with me these lines, Imamat of Ismail, designated by the Imam endowed with infallible knowledge, and which was now vested in all Sadiq other son, was explained as 
बदा इट इंप्लाई गॉड्स चेंज ऑफ माइंड बिकॉज ऑफ ए न्यू कंसिडरेशन इंप्लाइज गॉड चेंज ऑफ माइंड दिस इज द कंसेप्शन वी हैव अबाउट तो हीद that today allah is thinking something else tomorrow is going to think something else in the past allah's view something else is this the way we have tawhid brothers this is the book what i am reading so i have only said these words and that's why i came over here we all agreed that this gentleman is a scholar he has a tremendous of knowledge and he can give good teaching and lesson to our future generation but this could this could be a real uh astray the way you know what happened after the immediate death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know that the all muslim world muslim ummah the majority of the muslim world is saying that 25 years after the prophet where imam ali was silent quiet was very nice you have seen the islam all over the world because of 25 years the efforts after the image of the prophet but was it we are not endorsing that we are not we shia twelvers are not promoting that the whole world is said what happened because the path of islam has been astray through our beginning three rulers brother islami for future generation after 50 years if any scholar is going to come they are going to give us the reference of this book that your own scholar has written so much about tawhid and so much about imamat and so much about ahl al bayt is just everything is on creed nothing through the quran and through the hadith brother animani this is what we worried and scared about so you have heard i mean ayatullah safi gul paigani has uh, written the whole book and he has given that uh, such a tremendous way that means whatever the part of the world In continents and continents you will see are those people do not understand the language are those people do not follow and they do not have the academ academic background brother ani imani i am still taking one word of the speech of dr aziz then he has mentioned right here in his speech that the time has telling us how to deal with the non believers how to convey the message to non believers i am asking you if you are believers you are muslim you are shi'i to elders that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came was he dealing with the non believers or was he dealing dealing with the believers and how did he deal with the non believers don't we have the teaching of the prophet definitely the time has been changed but this is telling us that to save our generation and progeny whatever the faith and belief he is having he should bring through the pen we do firmly believe that in in, in his heart and his mind is not such a concept about allah subhanahu wa taala whatever is written in this book so brother animani what mullah saab said we should leave this behind but not just like that you know something in front of allah subhanahu wa taala that is the best slave of allah subhanahu wa taala who has did something wrong he said this is wrong and that is right we cannot mix together wrong and right if anyone has did something wrong and he has been accepted in front of allah subhanahu wa taala he is the most pious because allah subhanahu wa taala is mentioning in holy quran the tauba is everything if something wrong goes through the pen through the wording or by any means in front of allah subhanahu wa taala and you know something this is definitely anything you are doing in your home this is your secrecy this between you and allah subhanahu wa taala why i am coming over here on this floor because this has been publicized if this book has been the thesis in written and stays in the university of toronto you know nobody has could say nothing why it become publicized like that salawat ala muhammad wa ala muhammad i am of the opinion here as it enough has been said about this book and i think that uh, subject to there being general consensus on the matter that if we start making comments on asking more and more questions on this book there will be an obligation on the part of 
Dr. Abdul Aziz Sachedina, or for that matter, any of the other religious scholars, to make a comment or to answer that question. So if there is a consensus on the book, uh, on, on the issue, is to put this book and the discussion on it behind us and to start afresh, I would request, based on that consensus, if that does exist, that we stop referring to this book anymore during the course of this open forum. Is that, is that a joke? Is that, is that uh, something that is... Uh, there have been some questions that have come from the ladies' sections uh, that have been addressed primarily to Mullah Asghar, and he wants to take this opportunity to answer them. After that, I've seen uh, Brother Hamid Mawani, sorry, prior to Hamid Mawani, there's uh, Brother Ramzan Manek, uh, Hamid Mawani, Gulams, oh yeah, I'll give you an opportunity, but it's going to be Mullah Asghar responding to the questions, Ramzan Manek, Hamid Mawani, Gulam Sajan, I see one other hand raised there, but your turn will come. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salamun alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There have been some questions, Mr. President, coming from the ladies. And I, as far as my reading goes, the line of argument is constant. Therefore, one answer to all of them should suffice. What they have asked me is, so when I said that the question of ghayba and aqidah being explained the way it was explained or in whatever form is explained to the non-believers, it is of no benefit to them, it, has, it will never be exceeded by them and they are not going to acquiesce in your argument at all. For they have made up their mind that they don't want to believe it. The question which has been put is that then the tabligh is normally done among the non-believers. And there are so many non-believers, alhamdulillah, who have converted to Islam and even to Shia Nashri faith. So what, shall you, what will you say about that? Now what the questioner has failed to understand is that I am not talking about the missionary work. And even those ulama who are sitting here, they know when we talk to the non-believers, we straight away don't go and tell them, from tomorrow morning you will pray five rakat namaz. You know this is a very famous story, which has been recorded in history, that one gentleman in Medina somehow worked on the mind of his friend and converted him to Islam. The days of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. And it so happened that it coincided with the month of Ramadan. So in Urdu they say, Sar mundate hi ole gire. You see, the moment they became Muslim, he had to fast. So the gentleman tells him that, gentlemen, you have become Muslim from tomorrow morning, you are going to fast. And he taught him what fasting means. And then he, early in the morning, he knocked at his door and he said, let us go for namaz subu He took him to the mosque, namaz subu and all amal and, and taqibat and all that. And then he said, now we can go home. At about Zuhur time, he came home again and said, tafadhal namaz zuhur So he accompanied him for namaz zuhur And then he came home and had hardly engaged in his daily business. And he came and said, now namaz asr So he took him from namaz asr And then late in the evening he said, get ready for namaz maghrib And he also then, after that, he went home and retired. And then he said, now namaz-e-isha. 
And tomorrow, don't forget, you go to fast. So early in the morning, when this man went, 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 again went to him and knocked at his door, he said, I have become Christian last night again. <laughs> I've gone back. I have reneged. So when we work on the minds, we don't straight away work with imamat. We first talk to them on things which are easily, rationally acceptable. So we'll first talk about the concept of Tawheed. And when a convert has understood Islam according to Ahlul Bayt, then he immediately himself tries to understand what is Ghaiba, what is Imam Zaman. So what the ladies have failed to understand is that there is a nucleus or a group of Orientalists who are our enemies number one. They are the examiners, some of them, although Dr. Abdul Aziz Hafadullah has said that they are British, some of them are Jews controlling the lobby. See, and you cannot get a degree or an award. They will try to put you round and round and round till you say what they want you to say. So you know that. Now, Bolana Hujatul Islam wal Muslim means that Akhtar Radhavi Sahib Qibla has given an interesting anecdote in his article that a person writes a thesis on, and you just now said that some of the communities have got their children doing a PhD without Arabic language. In Islamiyat, now you can imagine what sort of PhD it will be. It's just like somebody trying to become a doctor. PhD in medicine without having passed MBBS. You can't be a specialist unless you first become a general practitioner. I mean, you can't be in a master on Shakespeare when you don't know English. So you cannot be, you can't be PhD in Islamiyat when you don't know Arabic. I mean, this is plus two, plus two, four. This is simple. But they are becoming. And Dr. Sahib, inshallah, when both of us are alive, we shall see that they will be granted. In spite of their inadequacies, they will be granted. For they want those half-backed PhDs to come in the bazaar and misguide the whole Muslim ummah. So we have enemies. So, Ustaz Yul Muazzam. Mulan Sid Akhtar Radhavi has given an anecdote, a very interesting anecdote. He says that a person has written his thesis and he says that the Shias believe in five pillars of Islam and ten furu, five fundamentals and ten furu, furu, branches or ancillaries, whatever you call it. First is Salat five times a day. Second is Rosa means reading majlises. It, he has written that. Because, you know, he has taken from Persian Rauva Khani. In Persian, Rauva Khani means reading majlis. You read in the light magazine, have you seen that? Volume 27, issue number 3. Your questions answered. Mulana said, Dr. Rizvi has given that anecdote that and then he writes that I can't decide who to blame, the person who accepted the thesis or the person who wrote. So when we have enemies like this, who deliberately would like to see, Hamid Algar, you know him, you know, has written in his article, which I read myself, that one of the scholars wrote that the name of Ayatullah Burujardi was Usman Burujardi. You know what? You know where he missed out? Ayatullah al Uzuma, he couldn't understand. So he translated Uzuma as Usman. <laughs> Hamid Algar has written this. I have got an article of his, where he's discussing this modern scholarship. And there are not mistakes or blunders. I call them howlers. Things which are definitely done because they want to actually undermine the whole science of Islam. There, all the efforts that we do 
for those enemies who are confirmed and established enemies, they are all going to be in vain. <laughs> yeah, of course I believe. وَلِلَّهِ الْحُجَّةُ الْبَالِرَةُ for us is to see that we reach, we convey, we purvey, but to expect them to change because of our scholastic tendencies is different. Missionary work is different. I'm talking of that class which is supervising the scholasticism in the modern era. And this is happening today as I reported to you in School of Oriental and African Studies at the SOAS and it is also happening in Sally Oak. In Sally Oak, they have slightly changed. They said half the Quran was revealed and half was written by Muhammad himself because he was a genius. But in Soas, they are trying to prove that it is interpolated book itself, just like Bible, changed at the turn of every century. Now, having said these other articles, other questions you have read, Doctor, it's just the same. There's only one article question which is very very interesting it says that mullah sahib you started the controversy and now you want to close it <laughs> <coughs> this is one way of viewing it because in gujarati they say halku loi hawaldar The book by Mol uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz was under review by so many scholars. So many. And he knows well and you all know well. I was but a small fish in it. And I have... Huh? <laughs> There was no controversy. I write a book, Dr. Aziz censors it. Liaqat censors it. That's not a controversy. It is a question put before him and he answers it. Where we can't reconcile, we say we can't reconcile. Today that I have come before you, I have come here at the invitation of a Jamaat, which is a respectable Jamaat. I haven't come at the request of Chapa Chujio. <laughs> I have come at the request of a Jamaat. You see, and I see so many people sitting here from other Jamaat, I mean, I said respectable Jamaat. You see, it's not from the loop and Jew and all that. <laughs> it is actually a Jamaat made up of people. And a leader is not a leader if there are no people with him. You see? Well, when I was invited by the president, I did my homework. Why? Because I spoke to Dr. Aziz when we were on, on, on telephone. I said, doctor, and he said, because he sent me a fax, which was, of course, between him and myself and uh, a copy to give. I said, doctor, I want you to understand one thing. And he's here, that there isn't a personal thing between you and me. The matter is of Aqidah. Now, I'm coming there. How would you like it to be resolved? And he said, I don't want it to be glossed over. I want it to be discussed. So the people don't say that it is being glossed over. So I took this book and I have made my submissions. He took the same book and others. He made his submission. Dr. Liaqat also made submission. And Mulana Sayyid, Mulana Sayyid Muhammad Allah has made his submissions and some of the submissions, of course, he has himself chosen to give direct to him. Of course, they will discuss it. That's, there's nothing to it. The idea is, my friends, just as the Orientalists are after our blood, the same way this community, which is growing day in and day out, in number, in talent, and in age, has got a program 
and it cannot afford to waste time in these things. I do not know how long I will live. For now I am 60. And the Prophet did not live for more than 63, so I have no right to live beyond that. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me a longer life, we will see. And if we do not see, then these youngsters who will grow, they will one day, with their talents and intellect, write that the leaders engaged in petty quarrels. Or sometimes in important quarrels, but never resolved. Now, this is an important difference, and I want it to get resolved once and for all. For there is anything personal, Mr. President. I can assure you there is nothing personal. Abdul Aziz Hafadullah has not swindled me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may not show me a day where I swindle him. Nothing personal has happened. What has happened is a matter of my understanding of his book, which I have clearly mentioned, and his understanding, which he has tried. When I said that we should stop defending that book, what I meant, he, I knew that Dr. Aziz, as he stood at this rostrum, he said, he isn't here to defend. He said, these are the first opening lines. Now, what I say is this, that we know for certain that there are certain differences which can only be resolved when the scholars sit together and talk among themselves at that wavelength and that level. I understand that. But the impression must not be now given that no. You can't. Then that is a tug of war. I am not at all interested. I am interested in only one thing. And I told him, in presence of all of you, that the member needs you. The boys understand your language. The ladies understand your language. You can communicate with them. And there are thousands and thousands of subjects under the sun which you can convey and save the generation from going astray. Keep them steadfast on their path. Make them proud of their beliefs and not apologetic. And this is how all of us together, in the name of Imam al Zamana, have got to march ahead. That is it. Now, for that reason, Dr. Abdul Aziz, Hafadullah, stops talking about this now. This is my methodology. This is my research. We stop mentioning about this. When anybody asks us, we say, Lillahi, we know this in the name of Allah, that he is a believer. And he is a mu'min. Wassalamu madrak. Now, we want to continue. There are certain things where I may differ from him. I have just to pick up a telephone. Did you say this? Sometimes the reports are not correct. If you said, doctor, then this should have been this way according to me. And he would say yes or no. So that we have an agenda, Mr. President. Don't you have an agenda for Jamal? Yeah. You have taken up this position, we have an agenda. The World Federation has an agenda. Nasimko has an agenda. Everyone in the Jamaat has an agenda. And if the time is being spent on these differences, then of course these are the obstacles which will not allow us to go ahead. So resolving it was not by throwing the tub and the baby together. Huh? Resolving it is for both sides. We just forget it. And keep it aside. And from here on, and it is not for me to say Haveti member Abjo. It's not for me. Who am I? Tomorrow, Toronto Jamaat may decide we don't want to give him to Mulazgar. What shall we do? 
It's not for me. It's not for this forum either. Once it is understood correctly that we are working together again on the new lines, then of course the question of barring and debarring member does not arise. Wassalamu alaikum wa Al-Hajj uh, Mullah Sahib, respected uh, Aziz Bhai, Dr. Thakim, Maulana Rizvi Sahib, and uh, Brother Nazir Gulamsin, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Ramzan Manek, I'm from Hamilton. I was sorry to see that uh, Aziz Bhai was dragged into this, up to here. Rather than having the book given to the uh, Toronto Jamaat or send it to uh, Mullah Sahib and he could have made the decision and just uh, we could have get the resolution there. The other thing, we have known Aziz Bhai since the day this Jamaat was started and what he has done, the services to the Jamaat. So whatever is written, he probably we should have believed in him that he has written with faith. So there was no need even to uh, bring him all the way up to here. We, and could I, could I please uh, interrupt? No, no. Let's please not discuss about no, the no, book I'm anymore. Not going we put the book. it behind no, no. us. No, no, it's, no, no. As Mullah Sahib has put it very correctly, we are putting the book behind. But all I'm saying right now is that we have to come out of these four walls and get involved in the politics outside because we have to make our religion known outside too. And this is where we need Aziz Bhai, Dr. Liaquat, and Mullah Narizvi Sahib, whereby we can produce a lot of videotapes, books, and out that to take it outside and uh, we can give it to the non-believers there in the schools and colleges and all that. And this is where we need them. So we should be supporting them and may Allah give them good health and they continue their good work. Thank you. Uh, Brother Habib Mawani. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm not going to begin this short uh, comments I have with a long khutbah and tax your patience even further. A couple of remarks that I would like to make to, I think, dispel some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings that we have, and this is the forum where we are engaged in dispelling those myths and legends. One of them is that that those students who are graduating from the Western institutions are somehow tainted or they have certain kind of preset agenda or pre-commitments that are not in keeping with the Islamic commitment. Let us be very clear that we make a commitment to study Islam objectively, analytically, and also with a sense of commitment to understand our faith rationally and through understanding even solidifies our conviction in that faith. So we are not there to undermine religion of Islam at any cost. Let me give you a concrete example as to how this idea has now become concretized. Two years ago, the Hawza in Qom, Baqir al-Uloom, led by Ayatollah Misba Yazdi, began to send students from Qom to come and study at McGill University about Western methodologies, Western approaches towards the study of science of religion. And 12 students have come from the Hausa at a great expense because they are foreign students be paying foreign fees and American dollars that Iran can hardly afford to spend at this particular juncture of the phase of development. But they have sent a dozen students from the Hausa Bakr al Uloom to understand the Western methods, Western approaches, so that we can engage in an intelligent dialogue. How can we connect with the Western frame of mind, frame of reference? We are not saying sell off Islam, but to able to transmit that message, we need the same methodology. Once we are established within the institution, when we have many Muslim scholars of the caliber of Professor Abdul Aziz Sachedina, where today he is now a tenured professor where nobody can touch him, when we establish that kind of solidification, then we can engage in presenting an Islamic methodology. Until that time, we are left with the Ismailis, like he said, 
Let me bring you to another point then. These students have come and they are learning the Western methods endorsed by the Hausa of Bakr al Ulum of Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi at a great expense to the Islamic government of Iran. Let me bring to you another point that our theses are somehow direct, directed or steered in a direction that fits the pre commitments of the advisors. Recently, a thesis was presented to the examiners to prove the authenticity of Najd al-Balaga, to prove that Najd al-Balaga is an authentic, genuine, bona fide document attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib You would say, how can such a thesis be accepted in the academia of a Western institution, where there are biases, where there are prejudices, where there are preconceptions to malign Islam, to slander Islam, to undermine Islam? That thesis, let me tell you, received a grade of excellence, high distinction, it was raised to the level of the dean's list. The scholar is trying to prove that Nash al-Balaga is authentic. He was given a grade of excellence. He was put on the list of the dean. So let us remove this preconception. I'm fully aware of the history of Orientalism, how they have tried to manipulate Islam. And I agree with Mullah Saib. There was a history, a pre-commitment, deliberate commitment to steer Islam in a wrong direction. But that era has ended. In the academia, what we try to do what we try to do is not suspend ourselves from religion, we try to detach ourselves. We try to distance ourselves from Islam in the sense that we want to understand Islam unemotionally, without any emotional bonding. Many a times our youngsters ask us questions we are unable to answer, we say, but we just believe in it emotionally. What a scholar does in the West is detaches himself, not suspends himself. To study Islamic religion with intellect, with rationality, with scientific methods to study Islam, and then he comes to a conclusion with even more solid grounding. Why not refer to Al-Qunayn in Kitab Al-Aql Wal Jahal, where Imam Jafar Sadiq says, a person, a mu'min who understands religion through proper use of the faculty of reason is as solid as a mountain. Imam is encouraging us to go and study Islam because there's nothing to hide. We are not hiding any luggage in Islam that we are scared of any rational inquiry, any analytical inquiry. We are so sure of the truth of Islam that we are opening up the book and saying, analyze it, you will come to your conclusion, it is authentic. Scholars have studied the Quran and they have come to a conclusion that Quran is an authentic document. So it should be very, very clear that the academia that we understand of the Orientalists the era has more or less come to an end in most universities. I'm aware of some institutions that still have this lingering element of Orientalism, but it will end only when we are there to respond. Professor Abdul Aziz Sachidina, you won't believe universities are competing to obtain him. Do you know that? We are trying to debar him. University academia are trying to tempt him with high salaries. McGill was one of them. We tried very hard. McGill University tried extremely hard to obtain him. Unfortunately, they did not succeed. He went back to Virginia and many students petitioned the dean. How can you let a scholar of this caliber go away? Many Iranians who have come from the Hausa, they have protested to the dean. How can you let a scholar of this caliber go away? We need him. Therefore, I very much endorse what Mullah Sahib has said, his broad-mindedness, his great-heartedness, his generosity of, of tolerance is commendable. We need leaders like him at the community level to guide us and to show us the meaning of forgiveness, the meaning of tolerance, the meaning of agreeing to disagree without attributing motives to others. How do you know what he believes and what she believes? We have become God. Deciding the faith and the belief of other fellow human beings, it is beyond our Ability. We are dealing in the abstract world. Do you have ilmul ghaib? How can you judge our motives? Why we are studying in the West? I could equally make judgments about why people are studying in the Hausa, but I don't want to. This is left to each individual responsibility and each individual conscience. I want to come to another point, and I realize I'm taking more time than I ought to. Is that the issue was raised by Professor Abdul Aziz Sachidina that nowadays Ismaili graduates are coming out who are not prepared to really understand the Islamic texts. Mullah Saib also 
followed up that how can these people really become bona fide scholars training our students. Let us be very clear that a degree in Islamic studies that no, does not mean necessarily that you know Islamic studies the way we understand. Islamic studies today has become very prolif proliferated. There are many branches. You can specialize in modern developments and not read a text in Arabic. You can specialize in the development of Islam in India or Pakistan and not read a single text of Arabic. You can read Urdu. Therefore, PhD in Islamic studies does not necessarily mean that you are an expert in textual reading of the Arabic text. Islamic studies has become very broad-minded. Fundamentalism is part of an Islamic degree now. A person can understand the phenomena of revivalism, fundamentalism, tajdeed, without understanding a word of what the Quran has to say. It is possible. Therefore, PhD in Islamic studies does not mean anything unless you know in which area he has specialized. And these Ismaili students who are graduates will not be properly fit, of course, to be educators in the field of Islamic studies because they have not dealt with that area of specialty that most of us go through. So don't, we should not minimize, we should be careful and not make a generalization. <clears throat> Finally, Mullah Sahib said, we use strategies, different strategies. When we have a new convert, we try to first of all not tell him all the obligations, taqalif or sharia, rather we bring him and appeal to him the Islamic message through general ideas that are appealing to reasoning. It's a question of strategies. Marketability of Islam. That's what we are trying. We are trying to market Islam in the most effective way. What we are trying to do in, when we are trying to construct methodologies to engage in dialogue with the West is trying to construct strategies. How can I engage in an intelligent dialogue with a non-believing audience without them rejecting my work as being totally apologetic or totally tendentious. It's a question of strategies. We are not selling ourselves. We want to make Islam very potent, very vital, very dynamic, very powerful in an environment where we are viewed as barbaric, as uncivilized. We want to make Islam something appealing. And therefore it's an issue of strategies. Just like Mullah Sahib said, a new convert, you don't put all these burdens upon his shoulder. Likewise, in the academia, we are not trying to sell off Islam. For, take my example. I had a good job in accounting. I was becoming a CA. Why would a CA, a potential CA earning 70,000 plus, go into a field that he is going to be bashed by the community? Why? Because I love beatings of the community? No. No, none of us love the agony and the torment and the torture that we get from you. Nobody loves it. This is getting out of hand. We are not talking about. No. Nobody is bashing anybody. I mean, we're talking about the, the subject matter of the forum or something else. You're talking about, you're defending what, uh, what the Western education and Eastern education is. Uh, could you please just uh, make comments based on what the, what the subject matter is? I mean, what Mullah Saad may have said, what Brother Aziz may have said about Ismailis or whatever it is, quite frankly, to make comment on that now is irrelevant in the context of this forum. Right. Thing. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I'm mm -hmm. not making comments just in a vacuum. They are interrelated in the sense that when he talked about Western methodologies, why is Dr. Abdul Aziz Sajidina mm -hmm. on a stand here is because of his book. Mr. Abdul Aziz Sajidina is not on the stand. This matter is finished. We are not going to talk about Western education. Nobody, he can defend himself. Nobody has to defend himself. We are not going to waste our time here talking about Western education and Eastern education. The subject matter is very clear. It's comments and book that Abdul Aziz Sachidina has written. The discussions came about as a result of explanations or, or, or presentations that uh, Mullah Saab made, made and Dr. Aziz made. And I think really to talk about it any further is, is a waste of time uh, of, for this forum. So could you please, if you want to make any comments, just restrict yourself to the subject matter. Thank you. All right. Just like we have said tolerance and agreement to disagree, uh, that's fine. We can move on to the, uh, my final point uh, and wrap up this session, which I think has produced a feeling of love, a feeling of kindness, a feeling of tolerance. I commend, actually, the president of this Jamaat for undertaking this daring task to organize a forum of this sort. At the same time, I hope that in the future, disagreements of this nature can be channeled 
through more tolerant means without having to have the whole community engage in an issue of this sort which should we should try to resolve in a different in an amicable manner inshallah wa ta'ala let me conclude this session then by requesting that can we then adopt a resolution that once this issue is resolved and we all agree i think the respected panelists agree that this issue is resolved can we make a commitment that from now on the pulpit will not be used to engage in those kinds of activities anymore either against professor abdul aziz sachidina or anybody else for that matter that the member should be reserved only to preach the message of the ahlul bayt to preach love kindness forgiveness and compassion and to leave the personal agendas and personal vendetta outside the scope of that uh, member uh, as a as a consequence of this good meeting that we have had ahsantum assalam uh, brother over there uh. Uh, assalamu alaikum my name is hussein ismail and i come from new york uh, we have had the mullah, mullah sahab uh, respond respond to brother sachidina's uh, controversy whatever that we call it the controversy is closed he has laid a commitment saying that we forget about the book we forget about the controversy itself and let's start fresh but i did not hear a reciprocal commitment from brother sachidina as to that effect can brother sachidina please respond to that I guess, I guess what he's looking for is just is that you will not engage in public discussion on this book, which you already said anyway. I think everybody is getting tired here, so... Brothers Let's and sisters, salamu alaikum. I sincerely um, object to that particular request that we have from the floor. Uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz Sachidina has already been on the pod podium after Mullah's uh, proposal, and he did make it very clear that he did understand what Mullah's proposal was. By him not refuting what Mullah had to say, it is more than understood. Thank you. Uh, this brings to an end uh, all the questions and comments that have to be made. I'll just make some closing statements, then we'll have Tilawat and we'll close the session. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Salaam Alaikum. It's been a long night. We started at 9 o'clock or shortly thereafter. It's 5 after 1 now. I want to thank you all for attending this open forum. There has been open discussion, there have been comments made. Mullah has made certain gestures, showing us tolerance, showing us a way forward. Brother Aziz has also indicated that perhaps it's the best thing for us to put this entire matter behind us. I think that that's exactly what should happen. What the Toronto Jamaat will do is that there will be an edited and unedited version of this uh, proceedings that will be made available, a copy of it will be made available to each and every Jamaat, will be channeled through Africa Federation, through World Federation, and copies can be obtained by any of the attendees who are here who wish to obtain a copy from there. Once again, I want to thank you all. Thank you for your patience, for your tolerance. It has been a lot easier than I expected. I respect all of you for not having made this matter difficult by by making personal statements or irrelevant statements. It's been, uh, our goal has been achieved. I uh, thank you once again, and may Allah be with you. Uh, can, we, can we just please be seated for one minute? We'll have tilawat, and then the proceedings will officially close. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم وصدق مولانا رسول النبي الكريم وصدق مولانا امير المؤمنين علي بن ابي طالب والهداه المهديون صلوات على محمد